Go ahead and begin our April 2nd, 2014 Energy and the Environment Committee. Urge my colleagues who are not in attendance to make their way to the committee room. Thank you, Mr. Blumenfield, for being in attendance. And uh, with that, we will start as a subcommittee and hear item one. If we could have staff come up to, uh, to the uh, center table here. And thank you all for your uh, attention and uh, in the information that uh, the public speakers and staff will provide. I think it's really important to, uh, to highlight water, which all of you who are seeing this agenda are recognizing that this is a very, very important conversation that we're having. Uh, so with that, uh, please introduce yourselves for the committee and uh, begin. Good afternoon, uh, Honorable Chair, uh, Councilman Blumenfeld. Uh, my name is Adal Hashkhalil. I'm Assistant Director of Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, my name is Wing Tam. I'm with the uh, LA Sanitation. My name is Evelyn Cortez Davis, and I'm with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Water Resources Division. Okay, Petty John, I'm the Director of Water Resources for LA Water and Power. Very good. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, what we'll do is uh, uh, what we'll, do, it, we'll try to cover item one, but also follow through and give a kind of overview of uh, item two, three, and four, and then open it for question and answers uh, to address this. So uh, uh, I'm privileged to be here with you today uh, on behalf of sanitation. Uh, the sanitation is the lead environmental agency for the city in charge of the city's watershed management, clean water program, and solid resources program. We're, we're very privileged to be here with our partners from the Department of Water and Power and many of our community partners uh, and, and uh, stakeholders. Uh, we're here to uh, uh, provide you updates on the various water management efforts in LA, uh, especially in response to uh, many of the uh, motions, uh, especially in this uh, critical time of drought and uh, need for water uh, in our history in Los Angeles. Uh, Los Angeles was created and flourished because of water. And to sustain our future, we need to protect and harness our water resources, especially when it comes to rainwater and stormwater. Uh, our future depends on our willingness to adopt an ethic of sustainability. And if we don't commit ourselves to that and to conserving and recycling water, we will tap ourselves out. Uh, there is no new water in Los Angeles, but wasted water. For us in Los Angeles, although our water consumption today is the same as it was, 30 years ago, even with 1.5 million more residents in Los Angeles, thanks to many efforts on conservation and the work that has been done by our residents in Los Angeles and our partners in the Department of Water and Power, we are still importing uh, a lot of our water, over 85% of our water, uh, uh, consuming a lot of energy, bringing it to Los Angeles. Uh, at the same time, every time it rains, uh, as we had recently in the last rains, uh, Every time it rains, every one inch of rain in Los Angeles generates about 3.4 billion gallons of runoff, uh, which is enough to provide water supply for more than 20,000 households in Los Angeles for one year. Uh, the runoff is wasted down to the ocean, carrying pollution and flooding neighborhoods. Through integrated water management efforts and what we will be talking about, the one water management practices, we can harness that and manage that water in a green way, in an integrated way, to capture, infiltrate, and reuse that water to make Los Angeles more sustainable, reliable, and to harness that water and put it in our uh, water supplies while reducing flooding, enhancing water quality, and uh, reducing our energy consumption while improving the quality of life in our neighborhoods. As you'll see from the slides, uh, one water is a concept. If you recall, I know the chair of the committee, uh, Councilman Fuentes, I believe also Councilman Bloomfield were present at the conference that we had in Los Angeles back in September of last year. We hosted a One Water Leadership uh, Sustainability Conference in Los Angeles. And many of the discussions is how can we manage our water uh, issues uh, in a smart way. Our residents in Los Angeles have challenged us to maximize the use of our valuable resources to work together in collaboration, to leverage resources, to look at opportunities, to do more with less. And I can't see anything more, as you have pointed in your motion, Councilman Fuentes, and, I, and also in the motion from Councilman Bloomfield and Coretz and many of the motions that we've seen. I'm glad that we all realize how important that resource, but if we can 
work on it together. One Water can really revitalize this community, this city, but also address a huge need, which is the dependence on imported water and addressing water quality. And we've done examples through the success of Prop O uh, that uh, addressed um, Prop O in, in 2004 was voted by residents in Los Angeles uh, overwhelmingly by over 76 percent to protect water quality. But clearly they said we want to protect water quality in a different way. We want to do it in a way that can really harness water, provide multi-benefits, and do it in a, in a green way. Besides water supply and dependence on water, the challenges we have in Los Angeles are many. We have mandates for water quality. As you know, we have over 24 total maximum daily loads, which are requirements in our permits, stormwater permit, to comply with for bacteria, metals, nutrients in our LA River, Barna Creek, uh, Santa Monica Bay, all the way up, you know, to Hunga Wash, uh, the, uh, and many of the community uh, water bodies that we have. Plus, also, in the city of Los Angeles, we have flooding. We still, every time it rains, although we're dependent on water, we still have ponding and flooding. Um, and we can do something about this by working together. So uh, through this partnership, collaboration with our community groups, we will, in, we will build on what we've done over the last 14 years, which is called the Integrated Resource Plan, which we did back in 1999, was adopted by the Council in 2006 to manage water and break the silos, because that's really the heart of One Water. We used to plan in silos. You know, we used to do wastewater planning alone. We used to do recycled water planning alone water supply alone, stormwater planning alone. We said we need to break the silos and come together because that's where the benefit is. To give you one example by the water conservation, the work we have done through the last few years, uh, the water conservation did not just help us in reducing our dependence on imported water. It helped us maximize the use of our wastewater system, our treatment plants, our sewer system. We deferred the need to build wastewater treatment expansions, and sewers an equivalent of half a billion dollars that we had to do if we did not do this integrated planning. So there is a benefit that we have to do. When it comes to recycled water, we can plan for expanding recycled water as much as we want. But if we don't have the wastewater to treat, we cannot meet that demand. So in Tillman, for example, if you want to focus on the Tillman plant that we have in the San Fernando Valley, which is the one that's going to be ideal for our groundwater recharge, you'll hear more about it. If we want to expand that and move forward in the future, we need to make sure the sewer planning is done in a way to make sure the sewage and the treatment system is operated to meet that demand. And if we're not talking together, we can't do that. And this one water plan will bring that umbrella. We'll make sure that we're all talking together making sure we're sinking and, and using this, the, the same resources to help provide projects, things that complement each other, not to waste resources, but to complement resources. And that's really where One Water comes in. It's One Water is a concept of coming together, planning together, breaking silos, and we're still going to drill independently into the details, but the outcome will come together. And that's what you demand of us. That's what the community wants us to do is, is, is manage that limited resources, those precious resources, financial, water, whatever it comes to, to make it in a way that can come together and provide us the future that we need. We are embarking on the One Water LA plan for 2040. This is really moving us forward for the next 20 years and looking how we're going to manage water, how we're going to address water, and how we're going to push the envelope because we know the last few years has been the driest years and we have a drought. We have a, a huge issue, but also we have great opportunity. And we need to basically move forward in addressing this opportunity because without water, we cannot sustain the city. We cannot continue to move forward and to grow as a city and to flourish as a city. It's a, the heart, the engine of our city and our economy. And we're excited because what we have done in Los Angeles is being looked at by other cities. It's a small effort. We have not, we haven't done too much, but we have done enough to show what's possible. And this is just a project that we have in, in the San Fernando Valley, on Sun Valley, where we have Elmer Street with our partners from the agencies and the community. We're able to convert a area that used to flood, uh, used to be uh, a place where kids could not go to their school because of flooding, into an area that now is harnessing 
runoff from 40 acres of runoff, putting it underground into a, our aquifer, our San Fernando Valley aquifer, greening our community, making our community better, and, and addressing flooding. And this is the example we're saying. In this, in this example, this project, we, have, we were able to really leverage all these things. And we did a report um, not long ago where we show that for every dollar that's invested in a smart, integrated way, there's a potential of about $20 in deferred cost from flood building they have to build or added benefit from water supply augmentation, et cetera. That it is that for every dollar, if we do it in a smart way, in an integrated one water way, we can actually save our residents equivalent of $20 in benefits or deferred cost. The key thing is how we're going to coordinate. We have to challenge ourselves to continue working together. And, and under the One Water Umbrella, One Water LA plan for 2040, we will do that. We will uh, report to you regularly, but we will bring together different members of the uh, agencies within Los Angeles and outside Los Angeles, the community members, the stakeholders to come together to march forward on addressing these challenges and doing it and identifying plans and, and, and projects to move us forward towards the goal of sustainable water resources and uh, healthier uh, neighborhoods and community. Our, our partners in Water Power are focusing on many of the issues including recycled water distribution, uh, groundwater augmentation, uh, stormwater uh, harvesting, while in sanitation we're addressing water quality, expansion of the treatment plants, adding uh, wastewater treatment capacity to treat more water at higher level, uh, looking at the sewer system. All these things are coming together uh, through this plan to provide the city of Los Angeles a, a, a path forward to make us uh, more sustainable and reliable. Uh, and with that, I want to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Wing Tam, to walk through some of the uh, specifics on the stormwater issues, uh, and then we will turn it over to our partners, Water and Power, to talk about some of the other elements of water management. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. Uh, I'm very happy to be here to talk a little bit about uh, watershed, and here I'm going to address uh, couple of these motions that you have in here, item one and one, two. And the reason I want to talk about watershed and stormwater capture, they're kind of uh, linked together. And as uh, Dale mentioned that uh, we have a lot of challenges doing drought, water, su water supply, pollution, and floods, and also water quality regulations. And the one water is a good umbrella uh, as a way to manage that water uh, for all of us. And looking at, at the watershed in a, in a holistic way, including stormwater capture uh, as well as among other, as a, as a way, best way to deal with multi-benefits uh, that uh, we talked about in terms of water quality, water supply, flooding, wildlife enhancement, as well as uh, uh, providing open space. The over, overall strategy in how we want to manage the watershed is uh, looking at green solution and green infrastructure program. Um, currently, uh, part of that is dealing with water quality, water supply, because from that you could basically uh, provide an environment for the whole watershed to be healthy. Uh, currently, uh, we have, as, as Adele mentioned, over 24 TMDL regulation in stormwater. Uh, and uh, this requirement are from the state as well as the US EPA under the Clean Water Act. Um, stormwater capture uh, provides that benefit that allow us to improve this water quality uh, or to, to the river and, and uh, streams. By capturing this water for infiltration and for using it on site, we are actually preventing runoff from uh, going out and picking up a lot of balloon and basically going into the stream. Um, some of the typical pollutants that we're looking at in terms of stormwater are trash, metals, bacteria, sediments, and ni nitrogen. Uh, part of that, this overall three-pronged strategy we have is that uh, part of the planning effort, uh, we're preparing a watershed management plan uh, in uh, basically in five watershed in the CLA, and we're working with all the agencies. There's over 80 some odd agencies uh, in these watershed to be able to identify projects to implement uh, so that we could have uh, uh, to address a lot of these multi-pollutants that, that you see. Um, in fact, we will be having a workshop coming up 
on April 10th um, from 10 o'clock at the LA Zoo. So you all welcome to attend to see what this workshop is going to talk about in terms of our overall planning effort uh, for this. These plans uh, are due to Region Board by Ju June of 2015. So it kind of is in sync with what we're doing, and you can hear a little later about Stormwater Capture Master Plan, how this is linked together, that we identify projects in our plan, the Stormwater Capture Master Plan with the identify project, we kind of link together to be able to have cohesive plan in terms of how we want to move forward to address both needs. Um, let's see here. In the parallel effort, uh, as part of this, is our uh, low impact development. Uh, where right now we require developments to capture stormwater on site, on private property, to infiltrate, capture and use, and also biofiltrate. Uh, part of this strategy is that because private property uh, does contribute significant amount of, of water into our streets and riverways, we are tackling that issue from a private development side. The other part uh, in terms of the three prong is that you're looking at public right of way. We have over 6,500 miles of street in the CLA. Uh, looking at ways to capture some of that water in the public right of way, that includes your, your parkway and medians uh, to allow it infiltrate, you're actually decreasing that amount of water and cleaning up that water uh, for that. So we, all, we also have what we call Green Street Committee uh, that meets every month with all city departments as well as a lot of the non-government agencies to identify and develop standards to be able to deal with that or manage what that runoff is on those streets. Uh, so that uh, we could look at from the public's point of view as well as the private point of view. Um, let's see now. As, uh, as mentioned earlier, um, Funding for a lot of these type of projects came from many sources. We have city, state, and federal. For example, the uh, uh, city's Proposition O that was passed in 2004, and I say is, is one of the highest uh, of a pass, passing rate of any uh, bond was 76%. That half a billion bond will allow us to start implementing a lot of these green infrastructure projects. As you can see, a lot of these projects are current right now. Uh, in, in the slide from the LA Zoo to the uh, Elmer Perseo to some of the Westside Park projects. Currently, there's 36 projects that's been approved, uh, 24 completed, and there's 12 in progress. Another example of, of funding, uh, let's see here, um, is, is from the state. We have received a number of, of state money from Proposition 84 and 50, uh, and court, currently, you probably heard of there's, there's uh, some drought money that's going to become available uh, from the government that approved that. Basically, that money is going to become available, it's going to be distributed to what we call the integrated water regional uh, uh, management planning process. Uh, the city is part of that committee, it's a, a countywide committee. And uh, we are looking at developing a number of projects, identifying a number of projects that get submitted to the state as part of that drought uh, 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 funding that's available. Uh, and let's see here what else I have. So as I mentioned in earlier about um, uh, watershed, well, in order to have the LA River to be restored, well, you have to do a lot of things in the watershed, uh, like we mentioned. Uh, a lot of these green projects in the watershed contribute to restoring that uh, the LA River, uh, looking at reducing the peat flow that gets into the LA River, reducing the floods that get into that, and also importantly in, uh, improving water quality as well as the habitat uh, to, to, the, to allow you to have a more passive and active recreation in those river. Uh, so that's, I'm going to turn this over now to our Warm Power partners to talk about stormwater capture. Uh, thank you, Wing. Um, this part of the presentation is going to be in response to Council Motion 14-0281 uh, on stormwater. Uh, this first slide, and I wish the left-hand side was a color slide, but uh, it's black and white, dating back to 1949. And this, this is to give you an idea of what the problem is that we're trying to solve. So if you look here on the left-hand side, you can see that back in the day, uh, the San Fernando Valley was essentially 
a lot of open space, uh, wasn't really that developed. You had a lot of um, green space, which of course is brown in here, but um, it's uh, orange groves and a lot of natural infiltration into the San Fernando Valley, which fed the um, which fed our groundwater basin there. And, and you can see the, uh, the, the, the uh, Tunga Wash running down through there. And uh, that's, that's now turned into the 170 freeway on the right-hand side. About 60% of, that's right. And, and about 60% of the uh, space that was uh, mostly open space is now paved over on the right-hand side. So. Which, you know, my eyesight isn't that good. Come on. So. You, you, you tell, you tell, you, you tell me. <laughs> Chandler. What? Chandler. South Pacific. Oh, okay. All right. That's Chandler. That's the train. That's the train. Boom. Very good. Very good. Pretty last lot. All right. All right. My bad. Uh, but on the right, you can see, really, it's just it's pretty much paved over now, and about 60% of the... The area is, and this is true for most of the city, is hardscape. So you have streets and rooftops, and, and there's very little uh, left of the areas that would get a lot of natural infiltration. And that's had a, a negative effect on the groundwater basin in San Fernando Valley. So the groundwater basin in the San Fernando Valley, you're all familiar with, has a couple of problems, actually. The first problem, the biggest problem, is that it's contaminated. And the second problem is it's been... Uh, paved over. So you have a lot of urbanization. You don't get the kind of water into the San Fernando Basin that you used to. Uh, we've got to solve both those problems. Uh, the first problem uh, really is a key foundational problem. And, you know, if we don't get that groundwater basin cleaned up, stormwater doesn't make a lot of sense. Because if you, you can put a lot of stormwater into a groundwater basin, but if you can't pump the basin, it's really a wasted investment. So we've got to get the ba basin cleaned up. And we've got to do more to change the dynamic out there and get more of the rainfall into that basin. So that's really the goal of the Stormwater Capture Master Plan. We uh, have been doing quite a bit of public outreach on that plan. I'll talk a little more about the specifics of that plan here in a couple slides. But uh, we've done so far a lot of outreach to the NGOs throughout the community, uh, the governmental agencies that we're working with. Uh, we work with LA County very closely on a lot of these projects. Our sister city agencies, we've had uh, presentations on the plan. To, and we've had our first public meeting last Wednesday, and uh, Council Member Fuentes was there the entire time. Uh, so thank you again for, for being so interested in this issue and supporting us the way you have. But uh, that was a very well, uh, that was one of the better uh, public meetings as far as attendance-wise that the Department of Water and Power has had for a while. We had 85 people, and that doesn't include uh, my staff uh, there. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then also uh, we had, that same day, we met with the Green LA Coalition. There were about... 30 different uh, members from the NGOs, environmental NGOs, at that meeting. So you put that together, we're well over 100 people coming who are very interested in this issue. So it was uh, quite a successful uh, presentation that day. This slide just uh, is in response to a question you asked in your motion. You said, well, you've been doing stormwater capture in the city for quite a while. And actually, it's not a common known fact, but the Department of Water and Power in the city has been involved in stormwater capture for 80 years. And we're doing a lot more now than we used to, but we have a lot of in-place, distributed, and centralized stormwater capture programs. And so you asked a good question. Well, how are they doing? What did they do in this last storm? So uh, we went, I, I had my staff go back and look. This is the storm from uh, the big storm we just had, February 27th through March 2nd. That was the biggest storm that we had this year. And uh, how much water fell? You had a, it was a four-inch storm that went over those four, that four-day period. And that storm dropped about 30 billion gallons of water on the city. And uh, that's a lot of water. So it would meet about 70% of the city's annual demands. So uh, the total, if you look at it in an acre foot basis, oh, it's about 94,000 acre feet. And those of you who know, uh, an acre foot of water covers a football field about a foot deep. So you figure a column of water covering the fo a football field that goes up 94,000 feet into the sky. And that's about three times as high as an airliner flies. So that's a pretty tall volume of water that fell in the city during those five days. So how much of that did we capture in our stormwater programs? And these are the distributed and centralized programs we have in place. And uh, we captured about 1,300 uh, behind the dams. That's uh, Pacoima Dam and Tahunga Dam out, out in the uh, hills. Uh, also in our spreading grounds, almost 1,000 acre foot we were able to capture. 
And then this, the distributed projects, and this is where we're just getting started in the city to do a lot more of these distributed projects, but we captured 75 acre feet in our distributed projects. And also uh, the LA County Flood Control District out in the San Gabriel Mountains captured another 18,000. So of the 94,000 or so that fell, we captured about 20,000 acre feet of that water. Uh, this, our stormwater capture master plan is going to try to increase those numbers uh, moving forward. We, we've ha been making fairly good progress in this. If you look at actual stormwater capture on per inch of rain that falls in the city uh, since the mid-1970s, we capture about 50% more of an inch of rainfall that falls today than we did back in the mid-70s. So we're, we've made some progress, but we want to really ramp that up and do a much better job. So that's why we came up with the stormwater capture master plan. And it, it, it's similar to the thinking, our thinking on this is similar as it is to our conservation potential study. You spend a lot of money on conservation, the city does. We've spent a lot of money on stormwater. But when you go forward, you start realizing, well, you know, all those really logical, low-hanging fruit projects, a lot of those we've done, and we want to know where is the best place to invest our money. And that's really what the stormwater capture master plan is designed to do, is give us a vision of what are the most effective investments to make going forward, and uh, what type of a framework of time can we actually do those things. So scheduling and uh, evaluation of the feasibility of the projects, et cetera, is going to be in this plan. On the left-hand side uh, are the large centralized stormwater capture projects that we want to do and expand on. You see uh, one of the dams, I think this is Tahunga Dam and Tahunga Spreading Grounds. Uh, we want to do more projects like this and, in, and make the projects that currently exist better. We've got five large spreading basins out in the San Fernando Valley that we've made some investments in improving those basins. Primarily we deepen them, widen them, improve the uh, telemetry to let how the water goes into those basins. Uh, so we're going to be doing more of that. On the right hand side you see some of the distributed projects. And these projects are a wide variety of projects. You see a, a rain barrel, a rain garden, and then you see Elmer Avenue there. And uh, you know the the beauty of the San Fernando Valley is uh, back in the day the uh, the developers kind of ruled the world uh, in a way. <laughs> I hate to say that, but they didn't put any storm drains in out there, uh, except in the main streets. So when you go out there, you get a lot of flooding, and uh, that's bad for you know the public. But if you're a stormwater guy, that's a good thing because you don't have to intercept all that water before it hits all those storm drains. You just catch it right before it gets into the main drag where the storm drain is and get it into an infiltration gallery and you've got a great opportunity to catch a lot of water. And that's what we've been doing out there and we want to do a lot more of that. We did some at Woodman Avenue and we've got plans to do quite a bit more of that. But uh, those are the smaller projects, but uh, that's going to be um, a lot of the focus of the Stormwater Capture Master Plan is to give us an idea of what, what makes the most sense in those, those type of projects. Uh, the next slide here just gives you a little more detail on what we're going to be doing here. Uh, we're going to try to quantify the, uh, cap the capture potential, identify the projects and programs, uh, refine the costs of all these projects, and determine the timing and the milestones. And what you see here is just what some of the preliminary results of the study are showing us that we have today um, some active recharge. Uh, of about 27,000 acre feet a year if you get a normal rainfall year. Active recharge, what that means, that's actual things we build to catch water. Uh, passive recharge, that's just natural infiltration. You know, the valley has got a lot of paving over it, uh, the city does, but it's not all paved over. And so we're getting some passive recharge, uh, and that's what the 66,000 is. But we think there's a lot of potential in the future to expand those numbers. If you look, uh, we're thinking now that uh, we've got about 75,000 to almost 200,000 additional uh, stormwater capture that we could, we could do. And, um, you know, that's, that's a lot of water. It's, it's enough to provide for about 187,000 to 475,000 single-family households annually. And on the right, what you see is one of the preliminary results. We did a study of all the sub-watersheds in the city, and this is a, a map of all the sub-watersheds in the city. So uh, there's a lot of potential that exists to use lo utilize this local resource to a greater extent. Um, we have an urban water management plan that essentially uh, called for us to double our stormwater capture between uh, 2010 and 2035. We want to try to accelerate that, and this uh, stormwater capture potential uh, study is, master plan is really going to show us how, how we can get, get there. 
So I'll uh, move this along and I'll introduce you to Evelyn Cortez Davis, who manages our recycled water program, and she's going to continue to the uh, next council motion. Thank you, Dave. Mr. Chair and council members, I would like to um, make reference to council uh, file 13 1385 and 13 0952, uh, the uh, presentation that I have. Uh, that I'll cover will touch on the highlights of the reports that have been filed for both of those um, and should be with your office. So recycled water, just to start before I go on to the, to the slides that we have prepared for you, has been a critical part of Los Angeles water supply, although it's, it is another little known fact. Uh, we have been using recycled water in the city for over three decades. Um, many parts of Griffith Park have been recycled, using recycled water for landscape irrigation for that long. And um, it's, it's a critical uh, part of our local water supply strategy to expand that use, not only the types of uses, but uh, the amount that we are using in terms of recycled water, uh, a true partnership. Uh, the water is uh, treated and uh, de uh, produced by the Bureau of Sanitation and is delivered to customers throughout the city by the Department of Water and Power. So we, we can't do one without the other, so it is a true uh, collaboration. The recycled water is produced at four different uh, water uh, reclamation plants throughout the city. Um, we have over 350 million gallons, just about, of uh, wastewater that is treated at these four plants every single day. And um, although at this point a lot of that resource is going, uh, flowing out to the Pacific Ocean, we have plans to make sure that that, uh, that resource is captured and reused right here in the city. Uh, and increasing that use is uh, part of what we're here to talk about today. There are two key strategies to expand the recycled water use in the city, and one is to expand the network of purple pipes that is th uh, it's, exists throughout our city. Right now, we, um, we have about 54 miles of recycled water pipes throughout the city. It's a very small amount. By comparison, we have over 7,200 miles of uh, drinking water lines under the city streets. Uh, so we do have a lot of uh, very strategic expansion to consider because we don't want to rip open every street of the city to install purple pipe. We need to make it happen where it makes the most sense financially uh, and to maximize that use. We also want to increase the amount of groundwater replenishment. Um, another little known fact, fact since we're covering some of those uh, is that we have had a, a groundwater replenishment uh, project, a, a one of the uses out of our Terminal Island Water Reclamation Plant is, in fact, a seawater intrusion barrier project called the Dominguez Gap uh, Seawater Intrusion Barrier that is operated by the LA County Department of Public Works. And it utilizes advanced treated, recycled, purified recycled water from the Terminal Island Advanced Water Purification Plant. And it's been doing so since 2006, I want to say. Um, and so we do want to expand that particular use within the city uh, of Los Angeles. And we are um, planning uh, right now a project in the San Fernando Valley to do just that. Taking water from the recycled water, uh, sorry, taking recycled water from the Donald C. Tillman Water Reclamation Plant and uh, building a new advanced water purification facility that will allow us to have water that essentially exceeds drinking water standards um, and um, pipe it uh, to existing uh, spreading grounds and uh, potentially um, we're looking at the possibility of direct injection wells somewhere within the valley floor as well um, and we're um, looking to spread or inject up to 30,000 acre feet of purified recycled water um, into the basin. This is going to help Part of what um, Mr. Pettyjohn was referring to is keeping those basin levels healthy and making sure that the recharge is um, increased. So we want to um, have recycled water as one of the ways that we can achieve that. The water would then travel down into the uh, groundwater basin about 200 to 300 feet below ground, which is about how deep the groundwater table or level is, um, and travel to the nearest well field, which is, um, in terms of time, somewhere between two and three years away. 
that's how long it would take for the water to flow. Would be mixing with existing groundwater this entire time, and uh, it would be uh, pumped out for introduction into the distribution system after that water is uh, treated to meet drinking water standards. So that's uh, in a nutshell what the um, the project, uh, the groundwater replenishment project, basically consists of the first three steps you see on the slide there, which is treatment, conveyance, and replenishment, and the extraction piece is something that's being um, uh, pursued on a parallel track and it involves the remediation uh, topic that I'll be talking about to you shortly. This is a project overview of the groundwater replenishment project. Um, you see the Donald C. Tillman plant. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the Donald C. Tillman plant is on the left-hand um, bottom corner, and uh, we have an existing 54-inch welded steel pipeline that kind of zigzags up to the Hanson Spreading Grounds that was built in the late 1990s, year 2000 time East, frame. Uh, East Valley Water Reclamation Plant. That's the project, Mr. Lamont. Killed by the people who uh, uh, run the Daily News. Yes. You don't have to answer the question, but I think it was obvious. That, that, that pipeline was Sorry. built as part of the East Valley Water Recycling Project, and um, it uh, goes up to the Hanson Spreading Grounds, and the project basically would entail the construction of an advanced water purification facility, which does not currently exist, and also an extension of the uh, recycled water line from the, um, see the dashed line here, this dashed line, going up to Pacoima Spreading Grounds as well. So we have um, uh, a number of different facilities that would need to be constructed, and um, we are right now in the process of um, preparing environmental documents for this project. In fact, we had a public uh, comment period on the initial study, and uh, the notice of preparation for that went out in September of last year. We had um, a public comment period, and we did receive a number of comments um, from the community, and we are considering those now, and in, we are in the process of preparing a draft environmental impact report, which will be available later this year, um, and we are looking to um, have our board consider and adopt those findings uh, sometime in 2015. So. Um, one thing that I want to point out in this particular slide, the project schedule, is the um, engagement um, of the public and our stakeholders, which began really at the onset of the planning effort in 2009. Uh, this is something that was distinctly different that's than some of the past planning efforts uh, for the city and for the uh, Department of Water and Power and emulated really part of what was accomplished through the Water Integrated Resources Plan and the partnerships with the community that um, the Bureau of Sanitation and other city departments were able to achieve. We wanted to engage stakeholders early on in the process and we've been able to uh, uh, successfully um, uh, engage them and they have been willing all this time to invest their time with us for the last um, four years. So I wanted to share with you a little bit more information about that uh, stakeholder engagement process. Um, just the, before I close on this, however, I just want to point out the timeline to operation we're looking for for this particular groundwater replenishment project is um, the year 2022, approximately. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the Recycled Water Advisory Group. Some of the participants of the advisory group actually are here today, and I'm pleased to see them here. Um, we, have a, uh, we had a goal to engage a diverse cross-section of Los Angeles to essentially give, give us the benefit of being a sounding board during the planning process, rather than to develop the plan and at the very end present them with a draft. Uh, we wanted them along for the ride, basically. All the milestones and all the key um, planning uh, decision points, major decision points during the planning process, we wanted to be able to engage with this group. We wanted a group that was diverse geographically. We wanted a demographically diverse group, a diversity of interests, and we were extremely fortunate that a lot of groups decided to join us and invest their time with us. We had a number of neighborhood councils and homeowners associations. We have a scrolling list going on, going kind of fast. We're going to have the quiz on this later. <laughs> um, environmental and wildlife groups, uh, schools, uh, academic groups, um, business and business groups, um, other organizations and public agencies that have a vested interest either in water 
um, or in the valley, in the neighborhood. Um, and, and we were actually pleasantly surprised to see the amount of interest uh, from neighborhood councils as well. Not just, you know, the, the, what we wanted to make sure is that we had um, not a, necessarily just a group of folks that were going to come in and agree with us 100% of the time. We wanted to make sure that the diversity of opinions in LA were represented. About that diversity of opinion, we had about 60, uh, on average, 60 different organizations represented uh, on this, group, um, on this uh, advisory group. And over the course of four years, we engaged them and never really asked them as a group to give us a statement on how, as a group, they feel about the recycled water program until earlier this year. And a subgroup of this, um, our WAG, Recycled Water Advisory Group, uh, took it on as a task to independently develop what they called a consensus statement. And um, what they came up with uh, surprised, I think, even me, and I uh, was very optimistic in what they would come up with. And uh, they came up with a very extensive, uh, supportive statement for recycled water and for the groundwater replenishment project. I have an excerpt of it here. It is rather long, so I couldn't really quit fit all of it. Um, the Recycled Water Advisory Group strongly supports the use of purified recycled water to augment the groundwater supply that Los Angeles draws on for its drinking water. And it goes on to specifically uh, support the project and the, its location and the treatment process that we have proposed. Um, we, are, we are very happy that we have um, individual groups already signing on to this statement and or giving us individual letters of support for the project. In addition to the Recycled Water Advisory Group that we have support from, we engaged a panel of scientific experts back in 2010. We knew that uh, as great and fantastic a technical team as we could assemble internally uh, and with our partners at Sanitation and with the consultant team and these great minds could come up with something great, we wanted a technical peer review by an uh, expert that is outside of the city team. And that's exactly what we did. We engaged with the National Water Research Institute, who convened uh, an expert panel of 12 scientific experts, uh, and they put us to task. They really, they really sent us back for homework, asked us lots of very specific questions on what we really needed to consider to make this a viable project. And after about three years, they wrote a report uh, where they basically endorsed this project, um, the panel, um, if I can just uh, share part of this here, supports the city's efforts on portable reuse in the San Fernando Basin, including the groundwater replenishment project based on the proposed full advanced treatment and goes on to say, um, the, uh, underline the significant opportunity that portable reuse offers to city for a safe, local, and reliable supply for the residents of Los Angeles. So when we talk about groundwater replenishment, we're talking about rep um, keeping the the, the, the levels of the um, groundwater basin healthy. But we also have another issue, and Mr. Pettyjohn brought it up earlier. We have contamination problems in the basin, and both have to be approached in parallel. We have to uh, replenish and we have to remediate at the same time in order to make sure that our resource is maintained. So um, I wanted to kind of, since the two topics are tied together, just continue and uh, uh, um, give you some highlights on the report that we filed for the groundwater um, basin remediation, um, which was um, actually going back um, to 13, I think it was 13-1385 that also asked about this. Sorry, I skipped one. Groundwater contamination has been, has been an issue in the San Fernando Basin for some time. This is legacy contamination, uh, largely due to improper handling of chemicals and other uh, solvent-type chemicals since the 1940s. Um, we have many le legal and regulatory requirements associated with how we would clean something like this up, but the, the reality remains this. We have to remediate this and do it soon. Otherwise, we're facing the possibility of total loss of this resource in the next decade, and actually, it actually is sooner than that from what we're hearing from our estimates now. It could be less than 10 years uh, we're looking at. So we want to make sure that we proceed with this as expeditiously as possible, and also to make sure that um, in our efforts to proceed with the most technically viable 
alternative to remediate this effectively that we also uh, keep we want to focus on our ability to recover costs from the parties that uh, contributed to the pollution um, and not jeopardize that chance that we may have to recover those costs. So we have to do that, um, all of our activities with that in mind. Uh, just a little background here on the decline of groundwater production. We have um, the blue bars representing the amount of water that's been pumped in recent years since 2001 from the San Fernando Basin. Our um, annual wa water rights from the basin for the city of Los Angeles is about 87,000 acre feet. It is 87,000 acre feet uh, per year. And the last time that we were up in that range was 2004. Um, you can see that the, there's been a steady decline and the, um, this current year we're projecting um, only 34 about 35,000 acre feet um, of water being pumped. So we do see a, a dramatic drop in the amount of water that we can rely on from our local resource here. So you have, um, we talked about the, the legacy contamination. This is one example of one plume that's been, a uh, contamination plume that was, been, that was published by the EPA. Um, and it represents TCE contamination. So it's a volatile Organic, organic compound uh, and the concentrations are represented here. The, what I wanted to show was the, the approximate um, dimension of the plume that we're talking about. There's other plume maps and these are all available um, on the EPA website as well. Um, at this point we're estimating that um, the cost to remediate our, ground, uh, our groundwater basin uh, would range between 600 and 900 million dollars. Part of the part of the problem is, and this is what what's happened with our production wells in the same basin, is that we have 115 of them that we could be operating. However, because of the intrusion with the um, contamination plumes, as of 1998, only 58 of them were operational and reliable. Um, that number continued to drop, and as of 2009, we were down to 31 wells. This is a significant. Uh, uh, cur uh, curtailment, um, cutback of the amount of water we can, we should be able to pump from this groundwater basin. So we want to make sure that um, we can proceed uh, with potential remediation strategies. We're in the process of characterizing uh, in order uh, to meet the Department of Public Health requirements. We have to characterize the plume and they have a specific process that we have to follow. Uh, we have an, an quite a number of monitoring wells that have been installed uh, and um, we are in the process of finishing up the installation of the monitoring wells that will help us to better characterize the plume and to submit reports to the Department of Public Health that will allow us to proceed. Um, so at this point we're still in the characterization step. Once we can characterize the, the contamination, in other words, once we know exactly what's there and where it is, then we can go into deciding or recommending what treatment uh, technologies should be used. Um, whether it's centralized treatment or localized at each um, well field uh, or a combination of both, a hybrid type of approach, is something that we need to be decided after the characterization is complete. Ultimately, um, the approach will depend on four things. The, the, the results of the basin characterization that is going on right now, the requirements, because some of these uh, federal and state laws may be moving targets at this point, um, and uh, that requirement we're trying to meet, the maximum contaminant level or whatever the water quality standard is, is going to drive how, how much do we need to um, invest in terms of the types of treatment or the size of the treatment that we need to put in. Policy 97005 of the Department of Public Health has specific guidelines for the permit that we would need in order to draw water from this particular area. Um, and we need to make sure that we're meeting all of those guidelines. And of course, what is this going to cost and is it reasonable uh, to remediate and how do we protect our ratepayers to make sure that we have every opportunity to, um, uh, to consider the ratepayer impacts every step of the way. We're going to have to do that um, as we go. 
In terms of timeline, the characterization should be complete next year, and a couple of years later, we will, will be used the following two years to complete our environmental documentation for the project. We anticipate the in-service date for the, um, the treatment facilities to be uh, in place between 2021 and 2023, which is approximately the same timeline I've shared with you for the groundwater replenishment project. So that's basically where we are with both of those um, projects related to the San Fernando Basin. And I, that's what I had for you. You can go back to Adele for next steps. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Members, as you've seen, there's a lot of challenges that we have before us, but also I think the greatest thing is we have a lot of opportunities for us to change things and do things the right way. Uh, you know, as, we, as I mentioned and as we heard from our colleagues here, in addition to our dependence on water, we are facing challenges on poor, poor water quality, water quality mandates, flooding, uh, and uh, aging infrastructure and changing climate. Uh, to address these challenges, we need innovation, integration, and inclusion. These are the three things that we need to make sure that all are working together. Uh, and this is really what the one water management concept is, is we need to think outside the box. We need to find new technologies and new ways of doing things, but also using old ways, wetlands and other things that are old ways that we have done. But also what we need to do is engage the public, the community, through inclusion, integration, and, and, and participation, as we've done in the Water Integrated Resource Plan, the Isak Water Master Plan. We, we need to continue engaging the public and, and, and hearing their input and their advice because many of these solutions are solutions that the public have brought to us, you know, whether it's the localized uh, curb cutouts or, or restoration or, or uh, uh, redoing a front yard into a, a stormwater rain garden capture infiltration. Uh, these things came from the community and we need to engage the public and the community because the solution cannot be done on a regional level, cannot be done on a, on a small, uh, small sub uh, watershed, but it has to be done on, in every home, every house, whether it's through a rain barrel, whether it's through a rain garden. All these things have to be done together because that's how we're going to manage this water and this, this water challenge that we have because the benefit is great for us because it will make us more sustainable. It will reduce our dependence on imported water, but also will address water quality and we will uh, make our neighborhoods green and clean and, and healthy. The One Water uh, LA plan for 2040 uh, is being kicked off. We are soliciting stakeholders and public participation into the stakeholder process, which is the phase one of this effort. And uh, that should be starting right now, moving uh, to December 2014. Uh, for any of the stakeholders, any of the members of the community who are interested in signing up for being a stakeholder at different levels, uh, there is three levels of, of stakeholder participation based on the time that's available for them, either steering committee or advisory or informational level. You want to just know what's going on, that's information. You want to be involved on a regular basis, that's advisory. And you want to be involved in the decision-making process and, and framing the issues, that's in the steering committee that, that requires a lot of commitment and time. So you can go to the website at lacitysand.org slash IRP slash 2040 sign up dot CFM. Uh, if you just uh, go to sanitation's website, you'll have the information. Um, and we are also working with uh, the neighborhood councils. To date, we have 200 uh, community members who have signed up to be part of the stakeholder process. We are soliciting more names. We are working with the council offices, uh, but also working with the neighborhood councils and asking for representation. The goal of the state steering committee is to have a diverse representation of Los Angeles. We don't want one, rep, one side uh, represent Los Angeles. We want everyone in Los Angeles to be part. We want the steering committee to reflect the diversity in Los Angeles, and that's how we we're asking for. Uh, and then phase two will start in January 2014, framing and bringing all these pieces together to establish a comprehensive plan that takes us between now and 2040. Uh, and that will be done over a two-year period. In the meantime, we'll be working through identifying what we call low-hanging fruits, things that we can adjust, whether it's through policy changes, through in interim projects that we can do, and opportunities. Just to share on, on the, the, uh, the groundwater recharge, uh, which 
as the uh, chair of the committee now calls it, showers to flowers, which I think the right thing to say is, is, is now a resource. Uh, we, at the Terminal Island Treatment Plant that we have in, uh, in Terminal Island in, uh, in San Pedro, we are actually going forward with upgrading the plant to upgrade the entire plant to advanced purification system. Right now we have six million gallons a day that's advanced water purification system. We are going to 17 million gallons a day by 2017. We have Machado Lake project that we are cleaning it because of pollution in that water uh, body. We are using portable water to augment that lake to keep it going and alive. We will be using that treated water to augment the lake to keep the lake healthy and comply with water quality. In the meantime, we are working with Water and Power, our partners, to look for customers along the way between the treatment plant and Machado Lake to use that water, whether it's the refineries and many of the big users, commercial users, that can benefit from that water. That's really the example of collaboration, integration, and the one water model. So with that, I want to uh, open it for your questions. I'm ready to answer any of your questions. There's three reports I think already have been submitted for the first motion and motion number two and number three. Uh, and then, so uh, there is the uh, uh, motion uh, on item number two, Council 514-0281, the Regional Stormwater Capture Project. I think, uh, Councilman Bloomfield, that was your, your motion. Uh, the report is ready to go, just waiting for final signature. So we should have that transmitted over to the, sure. the committee uh, very soon. But the other three items, uh, Council File 131336 and the 131385 and 130952, those have uh, files that have been transmitted to your committee for consideration. Very good. Thank, thank you very much for the presentation. As uh, my colleagues and the members of the audience can tell, we took all of the items in, in the form of the presentation. What I'd like to do is take the items uh, individually for conversation. And what we'll do is we'll go ahead and uh, take the speaker cards on item number one, colleagues, and then we'll have uh, debate, uh, if, unless there's an objection. With that, uh, I'll ask Andy Lipkis, Liz uh, Croson, and Noah Garrison, and Francesca De La Rosa to come on up, please. And this is on item one. I will uh, call folks on the following items, but we'll go ahead and take item number one first. Mr. Lipkis. Thank you. And thank you re very much for holding this hearing uh, and asking the question. It's an important question for Los Angeles in general. It's extremely important now in light of the drought. And there's a really powerful opportunity for the city to take action now like it's never had because of the drought. We have a short-term emergency that is not very different than the long-term water crisis. And so to be able to ask for the integration as you have is, is really, really important. So thank you. Uh, you've seen the opportunities are coming up with the IRP. The last one was fantastic. It was a breakthrough project on integration. It began to show what could happen. It was cutting edge for the country. Uh, it caused the voters to, to support uh, a water bond over 76% to, to pass Measure O. Very important. It's very important that we're doing it again. The work that you heard just presented is also good of what, uh, what is happening with integration. But it's really just the beginning. The agencies are working really hard. They're working really hard together in a number of areas of special recycled. But there is a gap. Uh, that exists right now, which is our, our urgent opportunity, which is their, the water, work that they've been doing in this area has all been driven by regulations. The area in the gap could be driven by goals, how we need to meet the city's needs. So from the numbers you saw in the last presentation, that 30 billion gallons that ran off Los Angeles two weeks ago in that, the, the two storms, that translates to 7.6, sorry, over 7,000 gallons per person in, for the 4 million people in Los Angeles. Not every bit of that can be captured, but a lot of it can be. So the opportunity in that gap uh, to, to build a system that's part of this whole integrated system, as DWP says, we have to pursue every option on the table. You heard a lot of them today. The rainwater harvesting can really grow. And we'll, I'll speak more in my next minute to follow Great. up. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Francesca De La Rosa. I am the policy director with Works. Uh, we are an affordable housing developer here in Los Angeles that has incorporated edible landscaping in several of our developments, and I also serve as the chair of the LA Food Policy Council's Urban Ag Working Group. We commend the city for moving forward to develop a holistic water management policy. And given our current water realities, it is important for the city to anticipate the growth of urban agriculture and create forward-thinking policies that incentivize water-efficient food growing practices. Urban agriculture is on the rise in Los Angeles. There are over 1,000 food growing sites, um, and we anticipate more to come. As we work to strengthen our local water infrastructure, we encourage the city to invest in public education efforts to promote water recycling and conservation within a food growing framework. We encourage the city to prioritize and promote urban agriculture as a water friendly landscaping strategy and it should be considered as part of the ongoing One Water LA plan and other master plan conversations. Water security is our food security. We look forward to working with city staff to create a meaningful water policy that can create both food security and sustainable watershed management for generations to come. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Noah Garrison. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Noah Garrison. I'm with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, I want to uh, uh, echo the comment of Andy Lipkis here in particular um, that we really have an amazing opportunity here to address a long-term ongoing crisis with a, a, in the context of this shorter term drought uh, issue. Um, and to point out that the opportunities for, for stormwater capture, for using recycled water, um, other alternative water supplies in the city are tremendous. And uh, it's great to see that Bureau of Sanitation and uh, GWP are working together on this and, and in their individual spheres and sort of in a coordinated effort. Um, but I want to say that uh, two things really strike out that, that while we move to increase our water supplies and increase sustainable local water yield, uh, at the same time, we really need to continue working on conservation efforts and efficiency in the city, whether that's through uh, uh, minimal efforts in the home, uh, appliances, fixtures, anything else, or broader scale throughout the city. We absolutely need to continue to reduce the amount of water we use while we increase the, uh, the available supplies. At the same time, it's not just the agencies that are tasked with water that need to be engaged on this issue. We really need to be engaging parks, transportation, streets, other agencies that all can integrate into this uh, one water framework towards helping us with stormwater capture, providing available space to uh, implement capture projects. Uh, this has to be an entire city effort, and I'm, I think we're certainly thrilled that uh, at the start we have these two water agencies working so closely together. Great. Thank you. Liz Crosson. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Liz Cross, and I'm the executive director for Los Angeles Waterkeeper, uh, formerly Santa Monica Baykeeper. And I think what you see before you are environmental organizations that have also um, really in, in embodied this approach of one water, and that even for organizations like Waterkeeper that have long been working on stormwater issues and looking at stormwater as a problem that we need to address because of its polluting of our waterways, we are now tr shifting our focus, expanding our focus to look at stormwater as the resource that it provides and really looking at the opportunity for it to, so to contribute to local water supplies so that we stop um, our uh, reliance on those faraway ecosystems like the Bay Delta and the Colorado River for our water here in L.A. Um, one place that I would like to um, see integrated into this approach a little bit more would be for the city to use its authority to look at private property, um, specifically industrial facilities. The city of L.A., the Bureau of Sanitation in particular, has authority to look to those facilities. And as we talk about stormwater as a problem, if we start diverting stormwater on our streets and in the spreading grounds, that is absolutely critical. But we also need to think about the fact that huge concentrations of pollution are coming off of hundreds of industrial industrial facilities throughout LA. So if that's the only stormwater that's still running off, that causes a problem of impairment in our waterways. And it also is what has instigated many of these TMDLs for which the city is partially responsible for. So creative ways to encourage, to incentivize industrial facilities to also treat or infiltrate their water is, is a direction that we'd really like to work with the city on addressing. And lastly, when it comes to looking at an integrated approach, we're really looking for the city's support on funding opportunities. There's a, a you know a pretty large effort in trying to fund these types of projects um, that's been led by the county and that's now being um, spearheaded by a, a coalition of stakeholders. And we really need the city's financial and political support to make that happen. Thanks. Great. Thank you. 
uh, Michael Drennan, uh, Kristen James, I'm sorry, Kirsten James, and uh, Melanie Winter. Kirsten had to step out for a meeting, but we'll be back for other okay. agenda items. Hi, thank Drennan. you. Uh, my name is Michael Drennan. Was there someone else wanted to call? No, go, go ahead. Uh, Michael Drennan with uh, I'm a, with Black and Beach at a civil and environmental engineering company, and um, and um, my my title is watershed management practice leader, and I'm also uh, serve on the board of a local organization called the Council for Watershed Health, and I'm here today to just really to acknowledge the city or uh, the two departments that were um, making presentations earlier this morning for their leadership and uh, alignment of the principles that um, I certainly um, am seeing are valuable as we kind of go from what uh, historically we've kind of looked at as single purpose planning of projects where we you know typically you know, had a problem like a water supply problem, we created a water supply solution, we had a flooding problem, we created a flooding solution and now you know, as a as a uh, human, uh, you know, development occurs, we see the opportunity to look for win-win opportunities and and inefficiencies between those single-purpose solutions and come together to develop multi-purpose solutions. So it's great to see that as as a trained civil engineer, uh, I, I I really commend the the leadership of of your uh, agencies for you know coming to to this uh, c conclusion and moving forward with this and as a member of the council for watershed health we'd like to provide whatever support we can and as you move forward so great thank you uh melanie winter and kirsten melanie we're going once going twice i'm here <laughs> all right and kirsten james she'll be back good afternoon council members um I think you've seen some of the most interesting and exciting and important work going on in the city right now today being presented to you from a collaborative approach by some departments. And that collaboration really did come about through the IRP process, which has been noted was phenomenal. Um, and I think the One Water process is going to take it to the next level. I do want to uh, mention, and I, I believe that, the, that Adele is, is on top of this, but it's been interesting to note which departments in the city did not participate in the IRP. And it's really easy to tell which ones did not because they haven't shifted in the same way that those departments that went through that 10-year process have in their perspective. So I think it's important at this point to make certain that we bring in uh, building and safety and the Bureau of Street Services to be very, very participatory in this One Water um, initiative moving forward. And planning as well. In fact, uh, Recode LA project should be looking at the Stormwater Capture Master Plan. The drought that we're in right now may end with a heavy rain year, but it won't end. We will see it again. The cycles of drought are going to be longer, and the inundation will be heavier. We do need to be driven by goals, as Andy said, and water is one of the two most important things in the world. Everything else, as Carl Sagan, comes after that. Um, but we have to think about the challenges and climate change. If you're looking at the reports that are coming out, should be on our minds as we're moving forward. We are working right now on Water LA. Urban acupuncture is a strategic intervention at all scales, from spreading grounds and dams, down to green streets, down to individual properties. And we're working very hard with the city agencies to bring in individual properties to participate in this and create a new normal for Los Angeles moving forward. The residential property is the largest single land use in the city. Engaging every individual homeowner in this process is critical. And we've been working very closely with the agencies to develop what will be a new chapter in the low impact development ordinance that will be like a voluntary chapter for single family homes. So look forward to talking with you more about very that. Very good. Thank you. Adele, can I have you come back up? Because I've got a couple of questions here. Um, uh, and, and thank you for, for the public testimony and obviously to the staff for uh, helping us uh, understand uh, what it is that our different departments and agencies are doing. And I think we've heard. Um, from folks that re really the precursor to this was the 2006 council adoption of the uh, water uh, IRP. Um, and now as a result of that, we've got the One Water Los Angeles 2040 plan. And there is an awful lot. So help me understand sort of what the immediate things are that we're going to see as a result of these efforts. But part of me want, would like to see sort of a schedule with benchmarks and milestones of sort of what we can expect by when, because there's the... I think the sort of hard and fast uh, need uh, to make sure that we're doing as much as we can, uh, but then there's also the policy agenda that we've got to sort of make sure that we're uh, adopting and maintaining so that, uh, as one of the speakers mentioned, everybody is all in. 
And so um, help me understand what is it that we can see in the next year or two um, from the One Water LA 2040 plan, and, and, and where is it that we can begin to see a schedule of things that are going to happen? Because to me, there's so many layers that we need to be monitoring, and, uh, and it's pretty overwhelming. I mean, when you look at sure. the different plans, whether it's stormwater, whether it's recycle, whether it's the IRP, whether it's the 2040 plan, um, you know, that's all sort of uh, fantastic, but to keep track of it, I, I'm having a challenge. Adele, how, sure. how do we do that? So, so I, and, that's, and that's really the reason why we're doing the One Water LA plan. The One Water LA plan is not reinventing the Recycled Water Master Plan. It's not reinventing the rainwater harvesting. What we need to do is bring all that in a integrated, easy to read for the policymaker, yourself, and also for the residents and the community member to understand what are the things that we want to do over the next, between now and 2040. So the plan is going to basically bring the stakeholders, re-look really at some of the priorities, because things have changed since we started the, the Water IR Integrated Resource Plan back in the uh, 1999. There's other priorities. We have other challenges, other needs that we have, and we have learned a lot since then. So between now and uh, around the end of April, we will finish the solicitation of representation from the community in, on, when we start the process of having dialogue with the community members, with the stakeholders, to talk about what are their priorities, what are the things they want to make sure that we're looking at, to see if there's anything missing. At the same time, in parallel, we're going to look for things that we have already developed that needs policy changes and implementation that we will identify. For example, low impact development ordinance that was adopted by council in 2012 to require new development, redevelopments to uh, capture stormwater on site for captured infiltration reuse. That came out of the IRP as a side thing that we wanted to push forward as a policy that we need to do. So what we see over the next year between now and December is capturing and developing the timeline, the schedule, the deliverables, the, the path forward that we see from the stakeholders and, and some of the low-hanging fruits that we should act on because we think we're ready for acting on it uh, through the, 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 the policy body of the city. Uh, and then over the next two years, between December 2014 or January 2015 to December 2016, we will basically develop all the projects that, does, that have been pulled together, whether it's enhanced watershed management plan that's addressing water quality, but also captured on putting stormwater into the ground, the recycle water master plan, and it, uh, the expansion of the sewer system, for example, that we need to bring more sewers. Instead of having them go towards Hyperion in the valley, we need to bring them back towards Stillman to maximize uh, amount of recycled water. Those Detailed analysis that have not been done yet, we will do, and you'll have a comprehensive plan with timelines, deliverables, metrics, exactly how much we're going to manage so you can measure our performance and what we say we're going to do, both in stormwater capture, stormwater infiltration, recycled water, and, and all these metrics will be in place and available to you. But I think between now and December, I think we will develop a clear path forward, a clear uh, summary of what needs to be done and a deliverable. So between now and 2014 will be a stakeholder process. We'll start this, this, the first stakeholder meeting is May 21st and then from uh, January 2015 on we will actually do the, the detailed facilities plan, the project delivery, the financial plan and the environmental impact report to have it before your council hopefully early uh, in the middle of 2016 roughly. Before I go to Mr. Labonge, you know, as you're sort of, uh, uh, because even in your advisory stakeholder, there's three sort of uh, uh, categories of folks. We need to figure out, I think, at some point uh, where we plug in the ratepayer advocate, because to me, having a keen eye on what the potential savings in sort of the long and medium term is as just, just as important as the opportunities in, in the short term. Mr. Labonge. Number one, the ratepayer advocate should live in the service area for Los Angeles. Okay, no offense, he used to live in my district. He got a great opportunity to go to another neighboring city. But I just think members, our ratepayer advocates should get a bill, see, read all that information they get. Just did you mention that? I wasn't going to say I mentioned Number two, I think you should look at the city in threes. We're a, c a council of 15, but look at threes. Look at the Los Angeles River watershed, the Bologna Creek watershed, and the Mingus. Comptas to Mingus Creek watershed. 
look at three areas. Because there's not all the money in the world, but if we go and attack it, not by 15, we are one city, but by the three areas where the watershed come, it's real important. Number four, the DWP created the first check dam. They used to be at the spreading basins out by Forest Lawn. Put more check dams in the river so that you could pull water out and also pull trash out. I apologize if I, if I had to go to heaven, which I hope to, and if I have to go through Long Beach to get to heaven, I ain't going to get there because what we've done to Long Beach by all the trash that we send down the Los Angeles River. So consequently, what I'm saying is we have to pull the trash out before. Number five, put street cleaning in with sanitation. And lastly, number six, put water and power to the lead and get an office at the JFB, John Furrow Office Building, where one water comes together. Because I think what hurt us the last time with the East Valley, it took so long to get together, and sometimes a project is an orphan at the end. And then the mayor, Mr. Reardon, stood shoulder to shoulder with then the governor, Mr. Wilson, proclaiming this is the greatest thing that is ever going to happen, the East Valley Water Project. It took so long to come, we were right in front of succession, there was a headline, and it killed what is a good project, which Santa Ana and Montebello and other places to the east have been doing all the time. So we have to be smart. All water is recycled. And uh, just some of those points, and I do believe with the great work of sanitation, and I'd like the lead of water power because I'm an old water power guy. It all starts with water, and you have to control everything because if people don't believe in our water, they don't believe in the city. And we want to make sure it's always clean as it is. Lastly, just to let you know, because of the work of sanitation, I remember where anything, everything died in the river. That summer, guaranteed, there was nothing in the river. But once Mr. Horry and others, Mr. Tillman, they built these plants, they, they got it. Mr. Bradley, the mayor, pressure down. Dorothy Green, uh, uh, you know, all the work that she did and others, it caused the change in the water. So it is much better than ever before. But the street pollution is what our challenge is as we go on. And just could you explain to the committee the Pollock well sometimes for that? That's a well you should explain. It's an existing well that is, I think, not everybody knows about. If you bid me a good afternoon, I've got to get out to the district. Understood. Thank okay, you. thank you all. Mr. Goretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, a, a few things. One, have we looked at One Water as a concept beyond just the boundaries of Los Angeles? Yeah. Number one, the LA County is doing a lot with stormwater. I assume we have to coordinate with them. Um, number two, we share a water table with uh, uh, adjacent cities, um, and that may be an opportunity for coordination. And number three, funding. Uh, MWD has a lot of money. Um, it's possible that they would fund uh, some, uh, although I haven't talked to anybody over there, but it's, it's possible they would fund some of the remediation um, as an investment if we, if we found a way to make that happen. Have we looked at some of those things? Uh, it's okay. Let me just try to answer the first question. It's, I think, to me, water does not know boundaries. As I agree with you 100%. Uh, and we have a watershed that we have to manage water in a watershed. So... One of the things that in the new stormwater permit that was adopted recently, it requires the agencies to develop for each watershed an enhanced watershed management plan, which basically says, I want you to meet water quality, but do it this time differently. I want you to work together to identify these added benefits, the capture of stormwater infiltration, etc. We in the city of LA are leading four groups. Uh, and we have a workshop coming up next week on Thursday at the LA Zoo at 2 o'clock. And these four watersheds, especially the upper LA River watershed, Bayona Creek, Santa Monica Bay, and Dominguez Channel, we are bringing all the agencies within that watershed, working together in collaboration to address this issue as one watershed. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, yes, we're doing that, and we're coming together, and we will work together because the difficulty that we've seen before was when we develop a project that turns out that the best place to put that project happens to be in one city versus another city, and that's when it becomes a little difficult because of the financing, etc. But now I think there's a huge commitment, there's an agreement, and we're moving forward. And I'm glad to see this uh, first workshop with all the agencies uh, there next week. On the uh, groundwater issue, I'll leave it up to my partners, Water and Power, if uh, I'll ask them to, to help uh, with the answer. But on the funding uh, opportunity with uh, MWD, I, I, I agree with you 100%. I think we should pursue uh, because every 
drop of water we're capturing is helping with uh, the mission of MW, which is really increasing our water reliability of water supply, capturing water, imported water, bringing it underground, let's bring in local water, treat it, and get some value for that water that we're putting underground. So it incentivizes communities and cities to do more if there is a value for that water. Uh, and then hope, hopefully as we build projects, there is a revenue that can be generated for it that we can use now on another project and that becomes self-sustaining. So I, I love that idea. We'll pursue it further. We have four projects, I think, that we suggested to MWD as an idea. So we'll, we'll work with our partners, Warren Power, to transmit as a start to see if there's a potential funding. But we'll keep you posted. Very good. Um, as far as conservation, uh, oh, well, you had, Mar a, Marty is here. You had an answer first. Though. If I could add, this is uh, Marty Adams from Department of Water and Power. Uh, absolutely, uh, we need to engage regional partners, both MWD from a financial standpoint, because the, the water that, that we save here and increase our local supplies, water that we don't have to purchase and they don't have to import and further impact the, the state, the Delta. And so uh, we are engaged with them uh, both in long-term projects and also even short-term in terms of the immediate drought. They've helped us with uh, accelerating some groundwater cleanup projects as interim measures, and we're doing some more right now. Uh, in terms of L.A. County, is a great comment. Uh, L.A. County is a, a very important part of the stormwater capture. The, most of the large-scale facilities that have existed for a number of years involve L.A. County flood control uh, dams and, and reservoirs, and then releasing that water to the spreading basins, a couple of which the city owns, but most of which are owned by the L.A. County Flood Control District, or Department of Public Works now. And so uh, we're trying to maximize the stormwater capture on those. And then the, the, the bucket full of, of many other projects working closely with sanitation because those are all the places that you know you can't buy hundreds of acres of prime land in the, in the valley to make it other spreading grounds. So you have to look at how can you capture these other prime small pieces of water and, and every little bit counts. And so we want to we want to keep catch, capturing all these little flows of water and over time they will add up to a significant amount of water. And so those are the, the Green Street projects and the curb cuts and the things like that that we want to do uh, on a more local level to increase that. But, but LA County uh, is certainly a, a big player in the big water supply piece. Okay, and, and on conservation, obviously there are things that are education related that we continue to do. Um, are we looking at the items that aren't education related like uh, uh, the leak technology that I know they've used very actively in Israel, implementing that, or uh, uh, apartment house metering, which would, without a doubt, drop water use in apartments 10 to 20 percent. Are, are we looking at, although they're, none of those are cheap projects, but are we looking at that as a, a very good opportunity to, to conserve? You know, in terms of conservation, and, and you know, we've probably invested more than anyone in the nation as a city in conservation, and we have the results to, to be proud of because of that. Uh, we are now focusing a lot on outdoor water conservation where there's so much use and a lot of opportunities, and we have our turf buyback program. We've done a lot of irrigation programs. We have a, a very close irrigation cooperative effort with Rec and Parks where they're doing smart meters uh, in the parks and they're employing at-risk youth to install those systems. So it's a great partnership. Uh, there are opportunities at apartment buildings. I've had apartment owners approach us because dual plumbing is an expensive venture for them. And so they've asked about the possibility of low interest loans or things we could do to leverage to help them do that. One apartment owner, owner told me that he has two side-by-side -side buildings. He, he uh, did individual meters in one building and dropped his water bill by 30% because now people had a stake in the savings. And so those are, the, those are possibilities. We certainly have to look at what makes the most sense. But we have, uh, we're have we still investing about $35 million a year as a city in conservation. Um, comparatively, Met's investing about $40 million for Southern California. So we have a huge investment in this. We have hundreds of millions of dollars planned. And the water we don't use will be the cheapest water we can get. And so we plan to attack that very heavily. And we're certainly working yeah. with our partners here to, to make um, the most of that. And 40% of the water usage in a home is outdoors right now. So, and if it's not done right, it creates pollution for us on the water quality side. That's water wasted down the street carrying pollution that we have to manage. So it's, it's, it works together. Uh, and, and some of these ideas of what we call these slow hanging fruit policy changes that we can adjust is something we need to discuss as we move forward, whether the, the dual plumbing is an idea we had that never moved that far at that time. Maybe it's prime as we build more recycled water plants. Uh, recycled uh, pipelines and also 
uh, the individual meter of apartments it may also be something to consider in, in parts of the city. So we, we, these, these policy changes will be discussed and we're looking forward of how we can maximize them while we're engaging the business community, the, the homeowners and, and all the folks that have a lot to say in this and the apartment uh, owners and we need to make sure they're all engaged in the process. Well, I certainly encourage you on the individual metering of apartments because I think there's, there are a few things that are more of a guaranteed savings than that. Even, even without having a stake, people can't even gauge their water usage in an apartment. So. And, and it's, it's a question of how far you reach financially into the private areas. We're, it's, a, it's a question that we're looking at, so it's been asked a lot of us how, how to look at that. So. And, and as far as remediation, are we looking at the... the uh, this, the future side, in other words, how do we prevent adding to the level of pollution as we're cleaning up? So how do we guarantee that industrial sites are monitored well enough that they aren't adding while well, we think we've cleaned everything up and we're adding more? Or um, how do we deal with the street runoff to make sure we're not adding more pollution at the same time? Um, I'll uh, they'll adjust the street runoff, but as far as industrial, uh, you know, sources, I know that there's uh, a lot more regulatory oversight of private businesses. It's something that we don't and can't really get into as a public agency, but there are agencies that do police that much differently than they did in the past. And so what we're seeing now is the pollution that happened generally decades ago that the rainwater slowly pushed down into the groundwater basin. Uh, hopefully there's not new sources following that to the degree that we had it happen you know from the world war ii era going forward uh but what happened back then that was either not understood or not policed very well is is really what we see as the primary focus that we have to deal with so um, but i believe there's a lot more preventions in place so that the cleanup can happen but even with what we have that we know of from the past it's it's decades and decades, maybe hundreds of years to clean all that up. And so that's why the best thing we can do is make sure that the water that we pump out is, is treated to all the drinking water standards and meet standards all the time, because it'll be a long-term process for us. And hopefully, especially in, in uh, our look at oil drilling technology, um, it's claimed that it doesn't cause any, any water hazard, but uh, there's certainly a lot of other folks that, that have concerns. So we should look at that uh, pretty actively. Um, as far as stormwater, are, is part of what we're planning treating stormwater in the stormwater basins, or is it all trying to capture it before it gets there? Is there any way to, to, to create treatment uh, along the way as well? I mean, it, 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 we're, we're looking at many options. I mean, it varies. I mean, the, the easiest, cheapest, most effective way is to capture water closest, stormwater closest to the source, because that means it's less polluted, that you can really manage it closer. And also it means the less conveyance of flood system that you have to build to convey it. So the best way is to go upstream in the watershed and capture as close as you can up in the system, because that means less flooding, less system that you have to build, plus also cleaner water. However, in some areas in the city, such as Barna Creek and other places, we may have to do some treatment systems, uh, and we need to look at it. We had we just finished a project uh, in Penmar Park in uh, CD11, which is uh, a a uh, is a capture of runoff from the area, and that and going in a cistern of about 3.7 uh, million gallons underground under that. Uh, ball field that we have in the area, and it's going to be captured. Right now it's being uh, uh, captured for pollution, put back into the sewer system for treatment of the treatment plant, but we're working on a plan to treat that water and reuse it, uh, both in the city of Los Angeles as a recycled water and also with partnership with the city of Santa Monica for their uh, golf course and other things they have in the nearby. The same thing we have done actually up in, uh, in Highland Park in Garvanza Park where we actually captured, uh, you know, we have a million gallon cistern and infiltration gallery that's infiltrating the groundwater but also treating and, and reusing that water right there in the park itself. So it's a mix of two. Uh, last thing we want to do is do what was done back at the Santa Monica Pier, uh, uh, where we actually, a few years back, I would say about 15 years ago, we built a system that was expensive treatment uh, system of stormwater for reuse. Right now, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's operational. It's just, it was so uh, not reliable. It was so costly to operate and maintain. 
uh, was not really effective uh, to do. Uh, so I believe the best way, if we can do what we're looking at, is to go upstream the system closer to the source of water. That's the best way, but doesn't say that we don't have to do it uh, and reuse it in some parts of the city. I think the downstream Barna Creek area, etc. I think we may have to do something similar to a capture treatment and reuse. Uh, last couple of questions. Mr. Krebs, uh, so what I'm trying to do here is, and, and you can, I think it obviates the need for us having one sort of strategy dealing with water, but we've covered now in your questions the uh, one water, storm water, items one, two, three, and four. So what I'm hoping that we can do is, is just limit our, our sort of questions to item one, because I don't want to skip over the uh, members of the public who would like to speak on items two and, and four. So if you have more on one water as a planning concept, we'd love to hear the questions. And if not, we'll come back to you when we get to the other items. Uh, I have two other topics so you can tell me when or which one you'd like to discuss. Do they deal discuss with one on. water as a concept? Uh, sort of. Okay. Um. <laughs> so let's do this. We'll go to Mr. Blumenfield, and then we will come back uh, and deal with those so we don't use up all of your great questions. Mr. Blumenfield. Okay. I'll... I'll um, First, say you know I really I love the one water concept, and and I think we're all in alignment on on that moving forward. Conceptually, 2040 is too far for me because we're only going to be here at maximum till 2025 for the two of us. And so I, I want to move it move it faster, and I, I know that that we're not waiting till 2040, but it's it's our time horizon. Um, so, but that's that's great, and we do need to think long term. Um, I wanted to ask you about it. One thing is sort of the, this trying to align in the water debate, align the, the um, interests of the saving of the water and, and the saving of, of the money, so to speak, and that part of the frame which may work in this one water concept is figuring out better ways to align that. So when you're talking about apartment buildings and, and the fact that, as was mentioned, well, it's hard because we're dipping into giving them extra costs, well, there is a real savings from that. The problem is that the savings don't go to the apartment owners. It goes generally to us. So if, if part of thinking about this is thinking about ways to align the savings with the cost drivers. Um, and thinking of that not just in terms of the private sector side of things, but, but also more broadly in terms of where the money comes from, like from the state. The state is thinking about this big water bond. And, and we all know that, it, you know, yeah, they, there's lots of ways to move water down here, but it's a heck of a lot cheaper if we clean up the water down here than, than drag it all around the state. Um, and so again, but the problem is it's misaligned where the, the savings come in and where the costs are driven. So I guess as part of the overall frame, I would, I would ask us to look at that frame as well as part of this one water and figure out ways to better align those two things, even if it's you know a bank shot, so to speak, where we, we, we can't align it up directly, but we can put in some, some sort of intermediary to try to better align that. Because I think once you do that, the problem will in some ways take care of itself because it'll be, the incentives will be there. Because I'm, I'm convinced in comments from my colleagues about the ratepayers, et cetera, being involved in this, there is, mo there is financial savings here as well as um, water savings, and it's a matter of aligning them. Uh, in terms of the remediation and paying for some of this, I don't know the, the overall, are we going, how are we thinking of that in the, in the big picture? Because obviously it's hard to go after remediating the defense contractors from 40 years ago or 50 years ago, but how we view that is going to impact um, how we view the overall money in the equation. Are we sort of discounting that as, as gravy, or is that, is that an integral part of the way that we think about uh, the financing? In, in terms of the groundwater cleanup, uh, we know that there are responsible parties and uh, there's been a lot of discussions and a lot of uh, work with uh, our council on how to recover funds. Uh, one of the key things is that typically you recover funds then you do a project and we can't wait that long. So we need to be able to move ahead with the project at the same time not put at risk our ratepayer dollars and, and risk letting the responsible folks off the hook. Uh, that said, so we're factoring what we believe we'd be able to, to contribute there. We know there will be a ratepayer contribution. We're working very hard in Sacramento to make sure that any water bond that comes out has something set aside for groundwater cleanup, not just in L.A., but groundwater cleanup as, a, as its own element. Uh, there seems to be a lot of consensus in the state that, that groundwater cleanup needs to be identified as a topic for uh, a water bond, and we would hope that that would be a, a large piece of how we would pay for this. But we're looking for every means possible to defray the costs that the ratepayers would see otherwise. 
and on the example of the funding issue and financing and how, I mean, our financial sources are completely separated and there's a lot of uh, firewalls between based on amount, the source of water and it's just difficult, the source of money and it's difficult sometimes to, to justify there's a benefit here so I can transfer money. We need to be creative how we do it and it's a challenge. But one idea that we were looking at as part of the stormwater uh, discussion at defeat that, that was brought in as part of the county discussion and others is managing stormwater was one idea we had is is to uh, charge a fee based on uh, the uh, impervious area you have in a property but then adjust that fee based on the changes that you do on your property to manage runoff on site bringing it down to almost zero so if you in invest in managing runoff on your property through rain garden rain barrel cistern other things that you can actually zero your your water your, your stormwater bill if you do that. So these ideas and these thinking need to stay on the table because that's the best way to do it, is incentivize people to do the right thing. And that's, that example is just an example of just to make sure we're all hearing the same thing, but I think what you bring is perfect. We need to figure out a way how we incentivize folks to do the right thing and bring that money back to either fund more projects or benefit the people who are making the changes. Can I address something you asked briefly? Um, I, you know, 2040 is is a long time, but it, it takes, it's going to take a long time and a concerted effort to change the last hundred years of the city. Uh, but there will be things that happen sooner than that. So it won't be, we'll have projects coming online during that. Certainly by, before 2025, I will tell you there will be groundwater replenishment through recycled water. There will be groundwater treatment uh, plant. So those things will be delivered shortly after 2020 or thereabouts. And there will be, uh, the, in 2018, there will be the completion of the Headworks Reservoir. And by 2020, we'll have a wetlands on the LA River next to it. So, so, we, so those things will happen short term. You will and see results. And usually what we, you'll see is at the end of this plan uh, by, by 2016 is, is, if not sooner, you'll see probably go projects, projects that are ready to go for implementation with schedule with a, a, a funding and implementation that right away to move on them. And this project that are go if triggered, they're subject to something else to trigger them, they're ready to go, except they're waiting for something to trigger, whether it's a sewer project, an upgrade to a treatment plant or something. And then there is policy changes and things that we have to do. And those things will be in place with clear direction uh, to be done, and those will be clear to you uh, hopefully within the next uh, two years for you to, to act on, and then you'll see a clear path forward not to 2040. 2040 is the result, but we're going to move forward. And around 2030, I think we will be looking at 2050, 2060. Uh, we need to always be looking ahead as we move forward. I've got a bunch of specific questions I'll save for the individual items. One, one more overarching one water question, which is um, I know that sanitation and DWP have been working very well together um, as part of the team. Have the other uh, departments that you've identified been incorporated uh, adequately? Are they working well? Are there areas that we should know about that we can be helpful in making sure that the other departments are also in, uh, fully engaged? Uh, so we went ahead and sent an invitation uh, to all the department heads in the city with specific uh, requests for the agencies or the city offices that have direct impact, building and safety, street services, uh, planning, and others uh, to be part of a steering committee. We will have a city steering committee uh, oversight committee that will be working together. I think we got nominations from each of the department heads to have one person representing that department sitting with us as part of the steering committee with us city staff working together as we move this forward to make sure we're all talking, we're all you know, conversing and making sure our efforts are integrated. We've done very well here with Water and Power. Uh, there's more to be done, uh, but we will ask for your help and, and any help you can provide to stress the importance of everybody uh, being on the uh, playing field with us uh, to help move us forward is great. We can, we can only help when we know, when we know what the issues and, are. And Please we will, we will provide that, that, yes. So, so to that end, Mr. Blumenfield, uh, that's going to be part of the recommendation uh, to make sure that we try to um, hear reports back. Be before we sort of close this item out, Dr. Pickle, would you like to join us and give us the ratepayers' advocate perspective on the one water planning concept? Uh, the one water con planning concept is important uh, if for no other reason it's also mostly on one bill, uh, and, except for the stormwater component. Uh, so we're happy to participate in the process 
uh, I think it's important that we do do that assessment of the costs and the benefits and understand which component of that bill is paying for uh, which, uh, which component is benefiting and thus should drive the cost allocation in this. Uh, and on both sides, on or on all sides, the wastewater side, the stormwater side, the water supply side, uh, many components are being driven by mandates. So uh, the ratepayers have to cover that one way or another, uh, and we will be. Uh, so we're happy to participate. Uh, I think we can offer insights on the costs and benefits, and certainly we see the bills in this process. We get calls and questions, uh, as your offices know, from constituents and ratepayers all the time. And quite often, uh, although it's not our official purview to be commenting on uh, sanitation components, we get questions on those as well. Very good. Uh, members, any additional questions on item number one? Hearing and seeing none, positive? All right. Very good. So what we'll do is we'll make the recommendation to continue the matter and uh, instruct and request uh, the Bureau of Sanitation and the Department of Water and Power to report back in 60 days on the status of One Water implementation and its team and the development of guiding principles with an emphasis on local watershed, water supply development. And we'll ask that you all come back and give us a status on the community outreach effort. And we'll ask and instruct that you all, uh, BOS and DWP, include the Bureau of Engineering's River Project Office in the One Water Implementation Team to provide, to provide river-related expertise. All right. That, that is the order for item number one. Mr. Preto, item number two? Yes, sir. Item number two. Motion Fuentes, Bloomingfield, Labonge, relative to request in the Bureau of Sanitation, Department of Water and Power to report relative to the status of regional stormwater capture projects and how such projects performed during the recent storms. Very good. So we'll talk a little stormwater, but before we do, colleagues, let's go ahead and have, I've got one card on this. Mr. Lipkus, would you like to join us? Andy, come on up for uh, item number two. Regional stormwater capture projects, measuring our success. Right. So uh, I want to cover three things. I'll split them between the more other minutes. The multi-agency collaboration that's happening now with DWP, LA City, uh, sanitation and LA County Public Works to move to open schools to be able to capture stormwater so they are greened. Uh, it's a partnership that's been active with those three agencies and, and LA Unified. We're getting close to a breakthrough. It's very exciting. Uh, second, I want to talk about what we can scale immediately. And third is the remediation uh, questions you had. So I'll see what I can do. Uh, with the immediate it's important to know that there's a model from Australia who went through their 12-year drought uh, on how to scale quickly. The, the long planning efforts are absolutely critical, but this can dovetail and get out in advance. Uh, by this time in Australia's 12-year drought, they were already distributing millions of cisterns to homes across the country. With the city with the closest weather pattern to ours, which was Adelaide, now 45% of the homes in that city have rainwater cisterns, 30% in Brisbane. In Brisbane, they took their water use from 83 gallons per person per day to 33. Australia did this in a matter of just a few years by highly incentivizing, uh, discounting those rain tanks. We could do the same thing, but even better, by making them electronically networked and done right. What we would be doing is investing potentially the billions... 24 seconds? Uh, billions more. It's not me. It's not me. Oh, is that a fire alarm? Security Services Division. This is a test of the emergency system. <laughs> the emergency announcement system. This is only a test. But the drought is real. <laughs> so when you consider... The way to pay for this is through the integrated planning. It's, it's happening across the board, but it can be accelerated using disaster funds from the federal government, which hopefully your experience can help bring it to match the money that LA is putting, putting on the floor. You've got another 15, 20 seconds. Oh, good. Thank you.
The important thing to note, as you mentioned, how much energy, 75% of the energy in bringing of LA's water is to pump it over the mountains. We lose all that money. We could be in, instead investing in human energy instead of petroleum energy by building a system here in town. We believe there's tens of thousands of new jobs in the watershed management area where we could, by capturing stormwater correctly, uh, replace 30% or more of LA's water supply that's having to be imported. You get the double of the bang for the buck through the conservation. Thank you. Great. I'll pick Thank up you, the, next, the next round. Uh, I, I only have one other person who signed up for one through four. That's Melanie Winter. Come on up. Thank you. Um, the Stormwater Capture Master Plan is, is huge, uh, and it really does need to be integrated with just about every other planning effort that's going on in Los Angeles, from Recode LA, uh, and in particular anything related to the Los Angeles River. It's, we are looking at severe climate impacts, and it is clear that the channelized system that we have, which is reaching the end of its natural life, is at a turning point. It will either need to be rebuilt to do what it has been originally doing, to throw our water away as fast as possible, or it can be reconfigured to, re to reclaim and include floodplains, which is the recommendation from most climate scientists when it comes to flood protection. So the Stormwater Capture Master Plan is finding things that argue in that favor, and it's critical that we look at the river from that lens as well, and not as simply um, looking as an opportunity to build more in the floodplain, which is caused, has been recognized as the cause of all disaster floods in Europe in the last three years. Um, yes, it is important that we get to scale quickly, and it is important that we engage every single Angelino that we possibly can. It is important that we incentivize them to participate in this process. And I think this new chapter that we're developing for the Low Impact Development Guidance is going to help do that. Incentives that we're working with the departments on to um, add ones that don't exist, to encourage people to do this, will also help us get to scale quickly. Um, I was showing them pictures today out in the field of how many cisterns and rain barrels are being implemented every single day by our crew and rain gardens. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the city needs to acknowledge while we did a good job of conservation um, in order for us to grow, we're still at twice what cities with the same standard of living and climate that we have are doing. Twice. So we need to set a goal to get ourselves under 123, under 100 gallons a day per person, because Australia and Spain are at half that. So rather than continuing to congratulate ourselves about our great numbers on conservation, we can do so much better, and we should step up and ask people to do that. Great. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, any questions on item number two of staff? We'll have staff come on up. Mr. Kratz? No questions. Nothing on stormwater. Mr. Blumenfield? Uh, well, just on the, on the cistern question because I'm very intrigued by that in terms of the incentives that are out there that we can bring off the shelf today. I mean, I, when I was in the state, I had a bill to, to allow the, in, um, the forward funding of water conservation things like cisterns, and, and I know we have a lot of rebate programs, but, um, but actually paying the fixed cost in advance for, for homeowners and business owners is something that we're permitted to do by state law. Um, but I don't, we don't. We we tend to go the other route. Is there is there a way to go to do both, or have, have we considered that aspect? Well, what, one thing we did is for a long time there was really no incentives for stormwater capture on your property. Uh, we have been advocating um, through the Metropolitan Water District to try to get an incentive uh, to do stormwater capture for a long time, and recently, just within uh, about two months ago. Uh, we passed a stormwater incentive through the Metropolitan Water District that we now offer through uh, LADWP.com. And so you can get $75 to install a, a rain barrel at your home. So that's a first step. We've done uh, pilot programs for uh, rain gardens as well on a, a person's home. So uh, I've talked a, a lot to Andy Lipkus. He, he talked to me today even about uh, some forward-thinking ideas he has about expanding a program to be much like what you described, uh, Councilmember Blumenfeld, where you would actually incentivize somebody to build uh, cisterns on their property, and uh, through some sort of a rebate program, you would provide them with an incentive to do that. We don't have that in place right now, but we are looking at it. 
or ideally where it's basically free to the to from the user's perspective and then they see the payback on their bill sure you know over a period of time but it in the ideal world the payback is less than uh, is more than the savings but less than the savings that they get yeah so that it it actually works out in their favor there, there's um, we've having discussions through uh, uh, the Board of Public Works off the beautification. It looks like Coca-Cola uses a lot of uh, syrup for uh, making Coke uh, locally here. And these barrels that they bring from Atlanta, Georgia to here uh, are empty to be used. So it looks like there's an opportunity that we're talking to them about about 10,000 or more uh, barrels that used to be syrup barrels that can be retrofitted to uh, rain barrels that we're looking at a way to do it to engage uh, community groups and nonprofit organizations to retrofit these things and work with neighborhoods and community groups to give them out. The things that I want to work with Water Empowered in a partnership to see if, if the retrofit process and the installation can use that $75 rebate as a way instead of just buying it. So once we flush it more, I think we'll reach out to your offices to, to figure out how we can reach out and, and get that word out. I think that's a good partnership, uh, a good way of taking waste and using it now as a resource, which is a great thing. One of the things that does relate to this is we, we offer $2 a square foot to take out your lawn and install a California-friendly landscape in your yard, which would keep a lot more of the water in, in the yard and would have a whole lot less of water needed to be used on that property. So that those are not exactly, uh, you know, comparable to a cistern, but it has a lot of the same effect. And, and we just increased our incentive from uh, $1.50 to $2 a square foot for uh, our turf buyback program. And we saw a tenfold increase in the amount of applications we received when we did that. Um, Council Member Koretz is on the Metropolitan Water District Board, and that their board just recently doubled their conservation budget from $20 million to $40 million. Uh, one of the things that uh, that board is con going to be considering is how to spend that additional money. And uh, one thing that uh, we've had some interest in is maybe getting Metropolitan to add another dollar to the turf buyback program so that uh, we would be offering $3 a square foot for people to remove their lawn and replace it with California-friendly plants. And, and we've done a lot indoor over the years. Uh, we've got actually pretty good numbers. I know Melanie mentioned a, a number there, but uh, our residential gallons per capita per day is actually 89. So uh, citywide, if you add in all the industry and everything else, it's uh, 129. But, um, you know, the city of industry, they have a lot of industry. They have very few people living there, so their gallons per capita per day is astronomical, you know. So really a fair, uh, you get more of an apples-to-apples apples comparison between cities when you start looking at their residential gallons per capita per day. So we're down at 89 now. That's actually very, very good. It's one of the lowest GPCDs of any large city in the United States. So we're doing pretty good, but I, I do agree with Melanie. We've got to do a lot better, and we, and we can do a lot better. And I, we think that uh, our turf buyback program and our new focus on outdoor water use efficiency will get us there. Mr. Kretz? Just a, a follow-up question. Is, we're obviously trying to incentivize residential. Have we done the more obvious step of retrofitting all the city's own buildings to do stormwater capture? Yes, we actually have a program to do exactly that. We have a, a program that just focuses all, only on uh, city property. So we, we have our own LADWP property we're looking at, and uh, we're, in, we're making sure that we have our own house in order uh, as well. So that, that's how, how far along are we? What percentage of city buildings do you think we have stormwater capture? I, I think we've gone capture. through most of the DWP buildings, and I don't know uh, about the rest of the city buildings, but we can sure get back to you on that. Yeah, it's a, a, lo a lot of buildings if you add up yeah, all the city buildings. buildings so. Yeah. So the question that I've got, I mean, I've got a couple. Uh, I mean, obviously, I think that we need to figure out how to expedite all of these efforts uh, because, to me, you know, time is money. Uh, but through the chair here, I'll ask, how, how do we get MWD to kick in more to um, these types of efforts? I mean, if they just doubled their uh, uh, sort of incentive, um, you know, I think we fundamentally have a couple of challenges. One, just to get the information out to folks that you can get a rebate for the storm water barrel. You can get cash for grass. Um, but how do we, um, one, help spread the word, and two, get MWD to give us more? Mr. Kretz, feel free to, to chime in here. 
<laughs> well, Mr. Gareth was instrumental in getting them to double their incentives. So he, he let us know as soon as he came on the board, he was very interested in expanding that program. And, and we worked uh, with Metropolitan to, to get that doubled. But Metro, part of, the, part of uh, what's happening currently is we agree with you, uh, Councilman Fuentes, uh, we have a real problem with getting the word out. And so Metropolitan is going to be spending $5 million on a new campaign to get the word out on conservation. The DWP, we have a new campaign coming out as well uh, to start uh, pretty much now to try to get the word out on all the new incentives we've got out there. So I think you're going to start hearing a lot more radio spots and a lot more outreach uh, on the dry period and what people can do to both uh, take advantage of the incentive programs that we have and also to educate people on the prohibited uses of water. Uh, many people are not aware of the long list of prohibited uses that uh, are in place in the city right now. The city is currently one of the only cities in the Southland that has uh, instituted its water conservation plan ordinance uh, restricting outdoor water use, for instance. Uh, there's only, only Long Beach, Torrance, and the city of Los Angeles restrict outdoor watering off. We're, we're uh, under a mandate that people can only water outdoors three days a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday if you're an odd-numbered house, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday if you're an even-numbered house. And so getting that message out into the public's mind is, is of paramount importance. And when we had the last drought, for instance, and we really ramped up our public messaging, we saw a precipitous decline in water use. And we think we've got at least... Um, uh, at least 5% of conservation that we can probably get if we just ramp up the, the public messaging. But we have to go beyond that because with a, an additional $20 million, if you're only spending five on public messaging, you're exactly right. We need to start thinking about how we use the other $15 million to ramp up our incentive efforts. And that discussion is currently taking place at the Metropolitan Water District. Uh, the managers are talking about it, and uh, the Metropolitan staff is talking about it, and it'll, it'll eventually make its way to uh, the Met Board, and then uh, Councilman Kretz will be able to uh, affect it. Mr. Kretz. Uh, just a couple of thoughts. One, just anecdotally, my observation would be that well over the majority of L.A. residents think our drought measures that we implemented a few years ago have expired. Uh, so I think we need to re-message that. People thought it was something we did when we were in an emergency situation that we're not in one now. It's a very uh, good, yeah, that's, that's an So I think we need to start all over with that messaging. It's an excellent point. I mean, a lot of people feel that, you know, that, and that's why we try not to use the word drought so much because people say, well, you know, the drought's over. We can go ahead and water our lawn seven days a week. We've, we've tried to just talk about dry periods and get away from the word, term drought because in the public's mind, drought is a short-term thing that when it goes away, you can go back to your water-wasting ways. What we're trying to do in Los Angeles is keep the water use efficiency ethic going. And when the last dry period ended, uh, we decided uh, through work with the council and the mayor's office at the time to not lift the water conservation plan ordinance and to keep the three-day-a-week watering in place. I live in the northwest San Fernando Valley. It's very hot out there. Uh, you don't have to water your lawn more than three days a week, even in that dry, hot climate, to keep it nice and green. Uh, actually, watering your lawn more than three days a week really should be a prohibited use of water. It's really water waste. So uh, you're absolutely right. And the other thing is, uh, since DWP has an education program and MWD has an education program, are we coordinating so that, especially where there are joint messages that we, we coordinate, and were there LA-specific messages? Obviously not. But yeah, we do try to coordinate the messages uh, with the Metropolitan Water District. We work pretty closely with them and crafting their messages as, re as a regional message. Um, so yes, we do, we do do that. Good. Good sense. Uh, and I just want to sort of echo the point. Uh, and, and clearly, you know, you and I are both going to swap out our lawns for natives and the Theodore Payne Foundation and Sunland uh, in my district is a great source. Uh, we just missed a sale, so you and I will have a dig in because uh, since we both are in the valley. But, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, the education piece is something that we shouldn't just pin to the drought. Uh, you know, I think it's very important for us to recognize that we live in an arid environment, and, and as a result, we need to behave like it. And our challenge is effectuating that change uh, with folks and you know, trying to figure out, like in areas like mine, how it is that we're going to get folks to 
make the conversion. You know, I tease friends and family that my district is sort of the leading conservation part of Los Angeles because all you've got to do is drive through my district and see all of the dead grass on people's lawns. And it's not that they don't have pride of ownership. It's that they simply can't afford the water rates. And then you've got the folks who are the real conservationists who have ripped out their lawns long ago and it completely concreted over their front yards, which is, you know, equally bad. So, you know, it begs the question in my mind how it is that we're going to leverage technology, i.e. our new billing system, these incentives, and figure out a way to help people with the capital outlay of it because they can pay for it over time. And, and to me, we have the capabilities, or soon will, um, which is why if there's a way for us to expedite these types of opportunities, uh, and again, it falls underneath the sort of one water plan because strategically we should have these goals and then the subset of strategies on how we're going to realize all those goals, they can't happen fast enough. Uh, at least, you know, with, the, uh, w with what Mr. Blumenfield underscored here about our time being here, I think the opportunity to educate people is right now vis-a-vis -vis the drought, but the conversion has to be that we live in an arid environment and we have to behave that way. And, and that's a challenge. Uh, and, and I'm really excited, excited about what it is that we're talking about today because that is sort of the challenge head on. Um, I understand that the report isn't ready. I think you all testify to the fact that it's awaiting a signature. So as a result, we will continue this item uh, and come back to it uh, so we can approve it. Um, with that, let's go ahead and take items three and four together to see if we can move this along here. We'll take some public comment and then we'll have some uh, conversation and debate here. If Kirsten James, uh, Kareen Mandelbaum, and Andy Lippis could come up, uh, this is items three and four. The uh, LA Groundwater Replenishment Project and Groundwater Basin Remediation and the Local Water Supplies Groundwater Basin Remediation Stormwater Capture Master Plan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Kirsten James with Heal the Bay. Um, thank you for holding this important discussion today, talking about moving our region um, towards sustainable local water supplies. We've heard about a lot of great planning efforts today, the Stormwater Capture Master, Master Plan, the IRP, One Water 2040, the Enhanced Watershed Management Plans. But the problem is, is that a plan, plan is only a piece of paper until it's implemented. And so I'm here today to ask council to help in this regard. Um, first of all, in securing a local sustainable water supply, we've heard today that there's economic, environmental benefits. So to this end, we need to make sure that the city is meeting or preferably exceeding its many stated goals. We have the 2008 water plan that's yet to um, fully be accomplished. We have the urban water management plan. It's great to hear that LADWP anticipates exceeding the goal for recycled water 10 years early, but we need to remember that um, a few years back, that goal was 50,000 acre feet by 2019. So the goal has slipped a bit, and it's good to hear we're headed in the right direction, but we need to have our, our council really keep us on track for meeting and exceeding those goals. That's really the only way we're going to get our region to um, water reliability. And the, the second item I'll address, and Mr. Blumenfeld brought this up as well, is that funding is really key to obviously taking a plan into the implementation phase. So we really need to explore many avenues concurrently in this realm. You mentioned the water bond, um, a local funding measure. We need to kickstart that again. The Save Our Streets measure, very disappointed to see that there was no Green Street element, and that was completely punted on. We need your leadership to bring that back into the conversation. Prop 218, Form. Assembly Member Rendon has a great bill, AB 2403. I hope the council can move forward in supporting that. Um, so uh, we ask that you keep track of these critical efforts and also making sure that the, the um, city departments are collaborating because that will leverage funds and get us moving forward um, more smoothly. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Hi, Corrine Mandelbaum, Environment. Now, um, you'll see that a lot of the environmental groups are united in this position of thanking you for your support for local water production. I don't want to repeat much of what Kirsten just said regarding having slipped on the goals, but that has created some doubt in actually achieving the local water goals that um, DWP has set forth and that you have all supported them on. So um, in your support, you may be surprised, as I was, when reading DWP's 2013-14 budget, which allocates 
three times as much money to importing purchased water as it does to local water production. And I understand that a lot of the local water projects are expensive, but you've heard from many experts here today that there are many cost-effective ones, and you've heard before that it would create thousands of jobs to implement these projects in your very districts. So um, I want to reflect on why we're at this vulnerable position today. We continue to rely on imported purchased water for more than 50% of our water supply, even though we know that those supplies are dwindling and becoming more expensive. And I also want to talk about how you can help incentivize our move away from that dependency. And it's just like what you're doing today, you know, asking for accountability. How far are we moving along with the goals of local water production? How far have we come? How much more cost effective are they? And um, when are we going to see them done? So I will applaud you when you are able to see those projects in place and local water produced here. Andy. Great. So following up on the piece of this that has to do with roads, capturing and treating the water close to where it falls. Uh, Councilman Blumenfeld, you actually brought a project to Los Angeles from, with federal money that took parking lot water, road water, treated it, and put it straight into a cistern for uh, an irrigation system in LA City Park, our headquarters. Uh, that can be done in neighborhoods all over. It actually is part of a road project, which is why we need, as Melanie has said, everybody said we need um, DOT, to transportation in the city and the feds in the game, because the money that we're spending could be put up as a match. And if you look at the road bond, the sidewalks, all these things that can actually become rainwater capture, bioremediation, it's a potent attractant if we put our heads together and do one water right, we bring them in in a big way, and it's really going to lower the cost. So there's a source of funding there. Um, into the implementation at the homes, at the home level, when you do distributed cisterns, lawn removal, all at the same time, you hit a huge bang. So when the Australians drop their water use to 33 gallons from 83 gallons per person per day, it never went back up, just like what happened 20 years ago in L.A. So even uh, after their drought, it only went to 40 gallons per person per day. So you're getting a permanent shift, not just a short-term conservation shift, because as we change the infrastructure of the home, putting in a cistern, uh, doing the things that Melanie's doing with One Water, that we're all actually advocating, uh, you can remove the lawn, put in a food growing space, and radically reduce the amount of water use kind of forever. Thanks. Um, one, two, three. So on the streets bond, I just want to note that other cities have required, Tucson, for instance, has requirements that all new roads built have to capture a percentage of, capture and manage a percentage of rainwater. So that should be, at a minimum, something that we do if we step forward with this street, street bond. Um, on the side of the federal bringing other funds in, federal funding, they're a partner in CalFed. They have an interest in our reducing our demand there. So for groundwater cleanup, for anything that's going to develop local Los Angeles water supply, we should be able to make the case to get some federal involvement bringing it in here and then bringing the climate, the president's climate uh, directive order into the conversation as well should allow us as the biggest city that we are, to bring in some federal dollars to meet these goals. Um, <clears throat> outdoor water, 40 to 60 percent of your water use, depending on where you live, sometimes in the West Valley, even higher. Of your indoor water use, <clears throat> more, more than 50 percent of that is available for gray water. So if you start thinking of these things together with <clears throat> take, tearing out your lawn, now you've gotten rid of a bunch of your outdoor water use, taking your indoor water use and using it to irrigate your outdoor. You're cutting here, 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 and here. Again, it's urban acupuncture. It's a number of small projects bit by bit. And it's heartbreaking to see people pave over their yards. The cost of paving over a yard, however, is much greater than the cost of tearing out that lawn, building a swale, and putting in some native plants. So making that connection with these communities, as we're doing in Panorama City, as we're doing in Studio City, is making a difference because neighbors showing neighbors rather than us showing them has a big impact. Um, and getting to scale 
there's a lot of us here in the room, but none of us are big enough to do it alone. So if we have something to work from that you all are supporting as well, that we can all work together to accomplish through the Water LA program and One Water, um, we can get there. Curb cuts, I want to mention quickly, are capturing and infiltrating in the valley tremendous amounts of water, and they're turning the parkways into something valuable, meeting TMDL goals, very low cost, as well as getting tremendous amounts of dry weather and wet weather flow to the groundwater. Great. Basin. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, any questions? On items three, three and four, Mr. Koretz? Yeah, first of all, uh, oh, I'd have to ask staff. Okay, it's, it's, I'm sorry. Thank you for <laughs> you. Your, your comments. Uh, we're having staff come back up for the debate. Thank you. Mr. Koretz. Uh, one thing we haven't mentioned, uh, I know in areas uh, like my neighborhood, and I don't know how prevalent this is, there's, there's a high water table. So buildings pump out a certain amount of water in the dewatering process every day, um, and certainly more after, after rain. Um, do we have any idea how many, how many gallons or how many millions of gallons or how many hundreds of thousands of gallons? I don't know how extensive a problem this is. Um, are dewatered by pumping them out from buildings? And uh, is there a way for us to connect that in some cost-effective way to reuse the water connected to our stormwater system or gray water or something? That, that's a, a great question and something that actually came up uh, with us a few years ago, uh, trying to get a good accounting for how much is dewatered. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, we're, we're working on trying to put a volume on that. One of the issues, of course, becomes the location of the building and if you have to build a piping system or a treatment system, the groundwater quality. And so there's, there's some issues uh, from a water supply standpoint in terms of, of health issues, what you can do. From a stormwater standpoint, the question is, you know, right now it would pump into the storm drain system. The question is, is it a point that they can capture? Because once it's in the storm drain system, as Adele said before, it's harder to get it back out of that as opposed to picking it up directly for a use. So these are, this is something we're looking at. Um, it, it's it kind of hit and miss across different parts of the city, uh, and they're not always in the best areas that we could capture that water or use it, but it is a concern of ours, particularly because in some places it would affect our groundwater rights, that someone's pumping water that might be available for our ground, part of our groundwater rights. And, and, it, and it is a different situation throughout the city, but it is on our radar screen. And we also okay. have spots uh, in addition because of the high water table where water just runs and has historically run for, for as many years as I can remember, and I don't know if there's a way to capture that in it, some it, way. There's some ideas. We, we had an issue in um, the west part of Griffith Park where water just started coming up in people's living rooms, uh, for, and not a water leak. <laughs> and we searched and searched, and it was a high groundwater table. And, uh, this, and so one question is maybe there's an opportunity to develop a well field that both helps the public situation and then produces a source of water that was never available. There are some unadjudicated areas, um, kind of sub-basins up against the hills. And so this is a new area, maybe some new water for us, and it's something we're looking at. Um, it's not the big hit compared to the, the big groundwater quality issues in the basin. So there's, you know, we look at the cost of the investment versus what we'll get out of it. But we are exploring those because uh, in this game, what we're seeing from the drought is that, you know, every piece counts. And so we have to look at all these and, and look at what's the lowest hanging fruit, go after that, and then start climbing up the tree and see where everything we can yeah, work again. Yeah, uh, pumping groundwater, I mean, the regulations right now are a lot more strict. Uh, so let's say for a construction project, you want to do dewatering, it takes a long uh, process. You have to have a permit from the state regional board for your discharge into the storm drain requires treatment. And what we've seen, a huge spike over the last five years, an increase of uh, uh, water being put back into the sewer under a permit, industrial waste permit that we permit in the city. The good news about putting in the sewer, if it's in the San Fernando Valley or an area that is, you have a water reclamation plant below it, that water is going to be reclaimed and reused. It's going to help us. Uh, so uh, there is ways that I think we can uh, see if there's ways, if, if sewer capacity is available, if we can get it to the treatment plant, uh, is, is doing recycling as we are looking for additional water for meeting our demands on water recycling as we push the envelope. So that's an idea. So, but I know for construction projects, uh, they have seen a shift over the last five years that they are now getting us, getting a permit with us, uh, sanitation through our industrial stormwater folks to, uh, wastewater folks to uh, put in the sewer system. And, you know, when it gets to the sewer system, it gets treated and gets reused, so, which is good news. Yeah, it's, so, it, seems so it, sounds, it sounds like that, that there, 
at least uh, what you're contemplating now, there's not a good way to use the, the West LA high groundwater table for it's, anything. It's tough out there, and a lot of the water is brackish out there, and so it, it, it's difficult. Like Adele said, there's, you know, it would seem backwards to put it in the sewer, but if you have a robust recycling system, that may be the fastest way to get it to a treatable quality, and then you can, you know, then you can do something with it. So all, all these have to be addressed kind of on the individual basis, but in West LA, because of uh, there's a lot of a lot of salt in the groundwater, we have some rights there that we can't pump because of the brackish condition. And the same with if you probably can't landscape with it either, so it becomes a you know then the cost of treatment would be pretty expensive for that kind of water. And again, is there any way for us to use gray water in any productive way? Uh, because there there seem to be some that are naturals that are there there are hotel resorts with a lot of grass, and they waste a lot of water at the same time. So and, and, and through the IRP process, we actually, in the city of Los Angeles, you are allowed to use gray water systems. It's just a process you have to go through. There's a conditions by county health as to what you need to do. You can't spray the water. You have to have a, a separation system between um, some of your usage inside the house to make sure what's going outside is the right thing. So, so in the, in the city of Los Angeles, if somebody wants to use a gray water system, it's allowed. It's you need to reach out to Building and Safety. There's an information bulletin on how to do it. We will help you. Uh, our staff will help any uh, resident or somebody who wants to use it to do it. It just takes a lot more responsibility to manage that system. Uh, and it's, it's a lot of responsibility and permitting and approvals and then operation afterwards. Right. It's a lot of people, but it's not as simple as taking the washer hose and sticking it out, the, which has been done in the past. And there's a, they're trying to set up a formal process for gray water systems. And it's, it's been difficult in the state to come up with standards. It's kind of an unclassified kind of water. And certainly we're trying to do it in LA, but it's, uh, it's been kind of an unregulated source, and so there's a lot of concerns as you formalize that. How do you do that in a way that's responsible and protects public health? Because you have some big opportunities. I'm not thinking of people in their homes. I'm thinking of UCLA that has thousands of people living on the campus and then a lot of green space and nearby places with a lot of green space like uh, uh, the Federal Cemetery in Westwood where there's a lot of grass to be. So, so the good news with UCLA, we have a project with DWP and us that's going to be part of the one water plan is is a looking for a, a decentralized wastewater treatment water reclamation plant so if there's a sewer that's coming out of the, the school the school the UCLA campus and the area and we can build a treatment system on site on campus that can treat that water to recycle water use for irrigation uh, that's what's called this a, a full cycle on campus, uh, we are working with them right now on, on looking at the opportunity for that, along with other locations in the city. Uh, but there's also the same thing is, that's a treatment system, that's a reliability, that's a permit that we have to have, that's who's gonna operate the system, who's responsible for reporting. Uh, many things have to go in, but we're working through it, we're addressing it, and our staff are developing plan, which should you see this concept of decentralized treatment is going to be discussed as part of this one plan discussion, one water plan. Great. And one last thing. Uh, uh, in response to the motion that created uh, item four on today's agenda, I know that DWP reported that it could accelerate its 2035 goals by 10 years um, and cut in half the time that it would take to double our local water supply. Um, I think the preliminary finding of this was uh, in a uh, a, a draft of a reliability 2025 plan. Um, what's the status of that plan? Has that ever been finalized? It's, or is It's very close to being finalized. I know the general manager needs a chance to look through it, and I don't know if they finish on anything to offer, but it, I think you'll see it within the next couple months from us. So it's just finishing internal review. It has to go to our board to be adopted, but it's, it's pretty much ready. It's ready to go. Any chance that it would be... Uh, accelerated in time to actually be taken into account for the DWP budget this year and, and the city budget? Well, it is probably going to be a little bit more time, I think, because after the general manager sees it, we need to have the ratepayer advocate review it, and then we have a public outreach process to go through before it's going to make its way to our board, and then eventually I, I would assume it come over to the city. So I think we've got a little more time that we're going to have to work on this. So probably from a budget point of view, the first time it'll have an impact would be the following years. 
budget. Probably. That's correct. But there, I don't think our budget is inconsistent with the goals of the plan. No. Uh, you know, all, a lot of the project, particularly the big, the big groundwater project and the replenishment project are on schedule. They're not, they're not slowed down by anything. They're moving as, as fast as we possibly can on those. So even though we won't formally have that before us, uh, we'll be able to, to pick off most of those elements and make sure they're reflected in the budget. Yeah, you'll see them in the budget. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. I know the time is late. So just really this one, one thing I wanted to drill down on, and, and uh, in the presentation, page 29 scared me quite a bit, along with the, the graph on page 31 about the plume. And basically it <coughs> talks about the, the fact that if we don't remediate, um, we're going to have a total loss of this resource within the next decade. Yes. And uh, I'd love to drill down on that either here or by a report or in the future or some sort. I mean, that sounds like a ticking time bomb. How yes. fast is that moving, that, that time bomb moving? Are we losing, you know, if we're going to have a total loss in a decade, does that mean we have, you know, a 50% loss in five years or is it, is it sort of an exponential issue? And related to that is the ground, groundwater contamination is six to nine hundred million dollars, I assume as a snapshot today, but presumably related to the tw page 29, that number is also going to be increasing exponentially. And I, and I want to try to get my head around that and get a better sense of how fast those graphs are moving. And, um, and I think that should inform some of the decisions around remediation. Uh, particularly when you start looking at cost-benefit um, because the cost is increasing exponentially. Would you like a general answer now and a more detailed answer at another meeting? Or? That'd be great. So um, certainly what's, what's happening is we're, we're losing kind of one, one well at a time. Um, and occasionally we get a well back, but generally when a well becomes contaminated beyond a point we can pump it, then it just goes out of service. And so it's, it, it, is, it will, be, will be kind of henpecked to death as we get there. And our, our projection is that over the next 10 years at the rate we're going, we'll continue to lose wells as the, as the plume spreads and we find more contaminants. So, um, so it will drop. That's primarily because the TCEs and the chlorine, everything is spreading. Right. Right, it's it's, it's it's moving, and there's there's things such as the uh, the operable unit in North Hollywood um, that's uh, that's supposed to help contain the plume. We know that it's not sufficient to contain the plume. Uh, EPA is looking at another uh, another what's called interim remedy to increase the size of that. Um, there's questions whether that'll be big enough to contain the plume, and so there's sort of a ring that they'd like to keep the worst contaminants in, and then we have pumping that would be pushed outside that ring, and and we're very concerned about. Um, not just pumping our water rights, but when we pump our water rights, because we want to have as much capacity for emergency or for drought conditions. We want to be able to, to when water is available, to bring it, spread it in the San Fernando Valley besides the stormwater capture and, and the recycled water so that we can have that water to use during dry season. So, so it's both our water rights and the overall capacity is, is important to us. We're working closely with the EPA to make sure that we don't lose any of the capabilities that we've built over the years. Uh, but we will see the wells going away one by one as, as things continue if we don't start the, you know, to, to turn the table and get some treatment going. I mean, sort of proje I mean, it's projected overall in 10 years, but is there... It, we, we don't have a real date for when wells would go off. Um, I, I guess we have some modeling going on now that, uh, that might in the near future lead us to it's a little better data on that. The, the plume maps that we have now are ones that are done by EPA. We've had a large groundwater assessment study going on that's wrapping up, and that's uh, a, a more detailed look at all the contaminants, not just TC and PC, but, but other organic, uh, volatile organic carbon uh, chemicals, uh, uh, chrome, uh, chrome 6, things like that. Um, and so we're looking at all those contaminants in our study, and as a result of that modeling, we'll have uh, a lot better look at how that plume's moving and of course the reason for the modeling is we have to be able to show the health department that when we build a treatment plant that it'll have the capacity to deal with anything that it might that it might see in, in modern times so we need to make sure that that plant's sized and and has the right components to treat any constituent that it might face so but that will give us also a better look at how that plume is going to move in the next decade and what's at risk during that time am i wrong in my assumption that it, it it grows exponentially as it gets bigger or is it, it, is it really a constant it, for the last four it, years? It's really moving, you know, theoretically as, as it spreads out it should dilute a little bit except what you see is a there's a gradient in the valley so you know groundwater tends to move from the 
toward the uh, toward southeast, toward the, the River Narrows, where the groundwater at some points comes up in the bottom of the LA River. And so, so that's the path, but then when you have pumping, it influences that path and it pulls a plume sideways. And so, so you're, you're seeing this plume and, and uh, you know, from these point sources, by the point sources, you have hundreds of parts per million of contamination, but then it dilutes. But, the thing, but we're concerned when it gets to five parts per million of contamination. And so, so as we pull those concentrated areas, it may be diluted, but still way higher than what drinking water standards would allow. Or would, so so uh, the, the, the contamination is very serious. Um, where we're seeing it is much, much lower levels, but it's still uh, at a level that we can't serve and would not serve. I would love to, to drill down on that or get some sort of report back. Yeah, we, we could give you some more detail. With, with the graphics would help a lot. <laughs> Mr. Koretz, one more question? Yeah, uh, just to follow up. So we're obviously trying to push it in a certain direction to protect our wells. Is there no way to actually remove it or cover it? Because I know in, in the Santa Monica Bay when there was a DDT problem, that sort of got covered by sediment. Is, is there anything that's actually a, a solution, or are we just keeping it at bay indefinitely? In our, in our case, you have pockets of contaminated soil that are you know, maybe a couple hundred feet deep, and then and that's pushed down from where it leaks from the surface into the ground into the lower parts of the groundwater basin, and so you can kind of try to hydraulically contain it, and that's part of the the plan with EPA is to hydraulically contain it in a certain area, pull it toward wells that'll treat the highest contaminant levels and not impact the drinking water wells. And so there's a there's a big challenge as to if I pump over here and you pump over there, who's going to push the plume which way. So there's a lot of modeling, and of course it's underground so you can't see it. So you have to have good monitoring wells and, and good modeling to know what's happening with the plume so that you manage it because what you don't want to do is then is take that contaminated area and then and make it a bigger contaminated area. So that is the challenge. Uh, but unfortunately, you can only isolate it hydraulically. You have to basically manage it with the way the groundwater wants to flow and then the influence of, of, of pumping ground and, and trying to confine it without pulling it out of its current current area so yeah I'm not a scientist but I remember in, in the with the DDT issue there was a proposal um, to dredge it all up yeah. and uh, although uh, many folks in the environmental community were were siding on that side um, other scientists said that you'd be better off just leaving it where it was and letting more sediment cover it, it right. seems to have worked in our uh, case if it was the dirt we'd be fine but since it's going through the dirt and continuing down it's Polluting all the all the everything below it, so that's that's the problem. Otherwise, that'd be the the better solution if it was available. Very good. Okay, members. What we'll do here is we're going to go ahead and note and file items three and four. And as much that these reports have been submitted for informational purposes, I'm going to request uh, that DWP report back to the committee in 60 days on the feasibility of accelerating the EIR and implementation schedule of the groundwater replenishment project and potential funding options for the groundwater remediation project, including local and private partnership options. All right. Uh, since it's been mentioned a couple of times before we adjourn here, actually, we've got item number five. If there's no objection, we'll go ahead and take that on consent. Here and seeing no objection, that item is approved. Uh, it was mentioned in public comment, some folks uh, spoke about the Save Our Streets. Uh, just to inform folks, there is a briefing today at 6 p.m. at the Public Works Boardroom. Uh, room 350, you all should stick around uh, and go testify. That being said, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, good.